Chambers, if you have any questions, please see myself or my fellow sergeant. Um, so we're about to start shortly, so we ask everyone to kindly have a seat at this time. I'm asking everyone to please have a seat. Thank you for your kind cooperation. Good morning. Uh, before I begin my formal statement on uh, the Housing and Buildings hearing, I have a statement prepared uh, about a very special and important day, the National School Walkout. Uh, before I begin my opening statement regarding the very important budget hearing that we ha have all gathered here today for, I want to take a moment to recognize the many students across the country who are staging a National School Walkout protesting Congress's inaction after the horrific shooting that took place at Stonewall Douglas High School in Florida last month. Unfortunately, the threat of gun violence like this remains a reality for many New Yorkers. Just this morning, the lives of four innocent New Yorkers, including a one-year-old child, were taken in Brooklyn by someone wielding a gun. There's no question that more needs to be done on a federal level to enact common sense gun control measures that will help prevent further shooting deaths. The psychological and emotional toll of gun violence not only impacts the health and well-being of individuals, it's a detriment to the growth of local economies. Since we're gathered here today to discuss fiscal matters, I thought it appropriate to share a few facts regarding the detrimental impact of gun violence on local economies. Economies like those in central Brooklyn where unfortunately, as evidenced by the morning's horrible tragedy, gun violence remains a problem we need to address. According to research done by the Urban Institute of Washington, D.C.-based think tank, gun violence surges decreases home values, the average person's credit score, and home ownership rates. In D.C., every 10, every 10 fewer incidents of gunfire in a census tract are significantly related to, one, new business opening, creation of 20 more jobs in a new business, 1.3 million more in sales at new businesses, and one less business closure. Apart from the toll gun violence takes in terms of lives lost, there are very real consequences of not acting to create policies on the federal level that address this terrible American problem. So while I'm unable to join many of my colleagues and students across the city this morning in the walkout, I did want to take a moment to recognize this important act of protest and express my solidarity with those taking part. Thank you for indulging me. Good morning. Thank you all for coming to the fiscal year 2019 preliminary budget hearing for the Department of Housing Preservation and Development and the Department of Buildings. I'm Council Member Robert Carnegie and I'm the chair of the Council's Committee on Housing and Buildings. I'm joined today by Council Member Chin and Council Member Cabrera. We are here to conduct an oversight hearing on the fiscal year 2019 preliminary budget. The preliminary capital plan for fiscal years 2018 to 2022 and the fiscal 2018 Preliminary Mayor's Management Report. We will first hear from HPD's Commissioner, Maria Torres Springer, where we will examine all components of HPD's $870 million expense budget and $6 billion capital budget, along with details and progress related to the, administrator's hou the administration's housing plan, Housing New York. Over the life of the housing plan, the city has financed the creation and preservation of over 87,000 affordable housing units across New York City, which has exceeded projected targets and production goals. But as the city addresses the complex challenges of producing and preserving quality affordable housing, it does so in the face of a federal government hostile to housing programs. President Trump's fiscal 2019 budget request will reduce funding for the Department of Housing and Urban Development by 18% which would significantly impact vital housing programs citywide and at HPD, including the CBDG program, the Home Investment Partnerships program, and would reduce funding to sustain the Section 8 program. The committee hopes to gain a clearer sense of how HPD would absorb any potential cuts and how federal actions would impact operations and service levels. After HPD, we'll hear from the DOB Commissioner Rick Chandler. The committee would like to get updates on the progress related to construction site safety, and training compliance and enforcement efforts relating to recently enacted tenant protection legislation. After DOB, we'll hear from members of the public. I'd like to remind everyone that would like to testify today to please fill out a witness slip with the sergeant at arms so we can put you on the queue. Lastly, I'd like to thank Maria Torres Springer and Rick Chandler and their respective staff 
for joining us today. We will be affirming, we will now affirm in, in, the, rep, affirm in the representatives from HPD before turning it over for testimony. So if you could just raise your right hands for affirmation. Uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you so much. Uh, you can begin your testimony whenever you're ready. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Cornegy and members of the New York City Council Committee on Housing and Buildings. I first would like to congratulate the chair on his new role. I've very much enjoyed working on projects with you in previous roles and certainly look forward to another productive partnership. I'd also like to acknowledge our city's new speaker, Corey Johnson, who has been a champion for everyday New Yorkers from day one. I'm very excited about the many opportunities we'll have in the coming years to serve the many and diverse housing needs of our great city. My name is Maria Torres Bringer. I'm the commissioner of the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development. I'm joined today by our deputy commissioner for financial management and tenant resources, Eva Trimble, and our assistant commissioner for government affairs, Francesc Marti. Many members of HPD senior staff are also here to help answer any questions you may have over the course of the hearing. Thank you for the invitation to testify on our fiscal year 2019 preliminary budget plan and the way this proposed funding will help us collectively to achieve the agency's goals. This has been a significant year. January marked four years of Mayor de Blasio's administration and my one year mark as HPD commissioner. While I've worked with HPD in various capacities over the years, it has been truly humbling to see the full breadth of the agency's work to protect our city's homes and neighborhoods and develop a record number of affordable homes. All of this important work requires significant investment from the city and from the federal government. HPD's fiscal year 2019 preliminary budget is approximately 870 million. However, this includes about 90 million in pass-through funding for NYCHA. So aside from this pass-through funding, um, HPD's true expense budget is about 780 million for FY19. Of this 780 million, approximately 118 comes from city funds and about 660 million comes from federal funds. That means that 87% of HPD's expense budget is federally funded. This huge proportion of federal versus city funding in the agency's budget is important because when we seek to save city dollars, as we're constantly trying to do, the amount we can save is limited because, of, because so many of our programs are in fact restricted by federal requirements. City funding, especially city tax levy, is critical for strengthening areas not otherwise eligible for federal funding. We're thankful for the important role that city resources play in our expense budget and throughout the testimony we will highlight several areas where new city funding will help us further strengthen our program and our services. <coughs> Affordable housing, of course, is one of the biggest concerns that New Yorkers face, and correspondingly, it is one of the top priorities of our administration. Through a coordinated interagency effort, we are pursuing a comprehensive agenda to improve the lives of New Yorkers. We have achieved unprecedented results in our first four years, including 180,000 New Yorkers who've benefited from free legal services provided through city programs to stop eviction, harassment, displacement since 2014, Evictions are down by 27%. 148,000 New Yorkers live in apartments that have, that have had long-term affordable rents protected through the city's preservation programs since 2014. 60,000 seniors are now enrolled in the SCRI rent freeze program, up from um, 50,800 in 2015, and more than 13,000 New Yorkers with disabilities are enrolled in the DRE rent freeze program, compared to just over 9,000 two years ago. The Mayor's Public Engagement Unit has proactively made over 280,000 door knocks and phone calls to New Yorkers to make sure that they know their rights and are helped through repairs, legal services, and rental assistance enrollment. More than 5,000 affordable apartments hit the city's Housing Connect lottery in 2017, doubling the number from just four years ago. HPD's MWBE build-up program is involved in 42 projects with close to 7,000 affordable homes in 2017. Projects are expected to generate close to 200 million in spending for MWBEs. 
This administration will continue to advance all of these efforts and all of HPD's efforts to address the housing needs of local residents. Our mission is to promote the quality and affordability of the city's housing stock and the strength and diversity of its many neighborhoods. We strive to achieve this mission in four key areas. One, preserving affordable housing and protecting tenants. Two, developing new affordable housing. Three, enforcing the housing maintenance code to ensure quality and safety. And four, engaging neighborhoods in comprehensive planning. On the next slide, you'll see um, some of the results of Housing New York. So we're charged with carrying out the ambitious goals of Housing New York, which is the administration's plan to build or preserve 300,000 affordable homes by 2026. This comprehensive housing plan is a critical pillar of the mayor's broader commitment to keep the city affordable, competitive, and sustainable. I'm pleased to say that last calendar year, HPD financed more than 24,500 affordable homes, breaking an all-time record previously set in 1989. In total, the administration has financed close to 88,000 affordable apartments under Housing New York. We achieve these overall numbers while exceeding our commitment to provide housing for the lowest income New Yorkers. In 2017, the mayor dedicated an additional $1.9 billion in capital funds over the remainder of the plan to ensure that 25% of our volume is for extremely low income and very low income families. To date, we have exceeded even this revised commitment. About one third of the housing we have created or preserved is for ELI, VLI New Yorkers. Nearly half of the homes financed in calendar year 17 serve individuals making less than 33,400 per year or 43,000 for a family of three. But our work, of course, is so much more than just about the numbers. As we provide housing opportunities to low and moderate income New Yorkers at an unprecedented scale, we've also worked to create new tools that lay the foundation for our city to grow in a more equitable way. The city has made significant investments to preserve the quality and affordability of our housing stock. Preservation represents a significant portion of our work at HPD and serves as a powerful anti-displacement tool. To date, more than 59,000 homes have been preserved through Housing New York, securing greater affordability for tenants and financing building-wide and apartment-level repairs to ensure the long-term quality of that housing. Now every day, New Yorkers continue to feel the strain of extraordinary market pressures. Some, unfortunately, have the added pressure of banned ad lords who illegally force them to leave their buildings or surrender their rights. We do extensive outreach to tenants, especially those in regulated units, so they understand their housing rights. In addition to HPD resource fairs and essential tenant guides, the mayor's tenant support unit goes door to door to help educate rent-stabilized tenants about the city's resources, including free legal services. We also proactively combat tenant harassment by participating with the Attorney General and the State Tenant Protection Unit in the Tenant Harassment Prevention Task Force, which investigates potential harassment and brings enforcement actions, including civil and criminal charges against landlords who harass tenants. Our Housing Litigation Division also brings cases in housing court against owners who do not comply with outstanding violations and, when necessary, seeks findings of contempt and jail against recalcitrant landlords. As many of you know, these robust efforts have taken shape under the leadership of Deputy Commissioner Vito Masuccolo, and I'm very confident they will continue with similar vigor under the expert hand of Acting Deputy Commissioner Anne-Marie Santiago, who's here with us today. To continue these exceptional efforts, performing callbacks and complaint follow-ups, $181,000 will be added to the enforcement budget for temporary staff during the cold months, an additional $530,000 for 30 new vehicles to increase our response time during heat season um, by eliminating transit trips for inspectors. The City Council has been an important partner in expanding our toolkit to fight displacement and tenant harassment. Thanks to the leadership and collaborative efforts of Council Members Brad Lander and Richie Torres, the Council recently passed the Certification of No Harassment and the Speculation Watch List Bills, important pieces of legislation that will be instrumental in protecting tenants from harassment and speculative behavior. The Certification of No Harassment will be funded with an additional 466000 for contracts with community partners and another 511000 to support eight new positions at HPD, 
I look forward to working with the Council to implement these programs in the months and years to come. Um, next here, I want to talk about our efforts to lay the foundation for an affordable New York and ensuring overall housing supply increases in an equitable way. So it's no secret that there is a housing crisis in New York City. Although we do continue to add to the overall housing stock to create the largest housing stock on record, the vacancy rate remains low at 3.63%. We look forward to our hearing next week to discuss the state of our housing stock and the housing vacancy survey in more depth. But it is clear that the demand for housing exceeds the supply available and the housing market is mismatched to favor higher end residential developments. It is therefore critical that we increase the overall housing supply, both affordable and market rate, in a cost effective manner and ensure that as overall production growth increases, so too will the share of affordable housing. Through our partnership with the City Council, we implemented Mandatory Inclusionary Housing, or MIH, the most aggressive such policy in the nation, to require permanent mixed income affordable housing in all areas rezoned for residential growth. We also saw the most significant overhaul of our zoning code since 1961 with the passage of ZQA, or Zoning for Quality and Affordability, which removes many regulatory requirements that significantly constrain the creation of affordable and senior housing projects. We fought for and won reforms in the 421A program last year so that it now requires affordable housing to, prov to be provided in all rental developments using the exemption and eliminates tax breaks for luxury condos. To ensure that growth reflects the needs of our diverse and vibrant communities, we have put neighborhoods at the forefront of the Housing New York plan. For example, HPD launched a comprehensive community planning initiative in Edgemere in October of 2015, a great collaboration between city agencies, community members, elected officials, and local organizations. The resulting Resilient Edgemere Community Plan, released last year, lays out clearly defined goals, strategies, and concrete projects, representing millions of dollars in planned investment over the next 10 years and beyond. In 2017, we also released the Brownsville Plan, the outcome of another community-driven plan process that will result in the creation of over 2,500 new affordable homes and representing more than a billion dollars of investment in housing in the neighborhood. Further, HPD has also focused on the community-directed revitalization of vacant land in city neighborhoods. We accelerated our RFP pipeline. 27 housing RFPs were issued as of February of this year for 66 projects across 200 public sites that will generate more than 10,800 affordable homes. And we introduced a new tool called Remainder Interest to ensure future public control of all affordable housing developed on HPD sites. In addition, thanks to the funding from LISC, Local Initiative Support Corporation, we also launched our Zombie Homes Initiative to better address vacant, deteriorated small homes whose owners are behind on their mortgage payment. And at the close of 2017, we worked closely with Council Member Williams and Rodriguez to pass two laws that shine a spotlight on vacant land, both public and private across the city, to further accelerate the production of affordable housing. I want to thank these council members and the many agencies and advocacy groups who partnered with us to find new ways to help unlock more opportunities to develop vacant and underutilized land. We received a grant to create and expand community land trusts in New York City through Enterprise's new Community Land Trust Capacity Building Initiative. The grant will fund three CLTs, including one to support affordable home ownership and a CLT learning exchange for nine community-based organizations um, and affordable housing developers seeking to form CLTs in their neighborhood. I want to thank Council Member Richards, Williams, and our partners for supporting these community-based organizations in meeting their affordable housing development and neighborhood revitalization goals. I'm also excited to share that we're working in partnership with the Council on creative solutions to meet the city's housing needs. For example, often basements are converted into illegal and unsafe housing, but if brought up to code, they could be safe and affordable options for New Yorkers. Although the logistics of bringing, a basement in, bringing basements and cellars up to code are complex, we are excited about funding for a pilot program in East New York. 
Upon the passage of legislation by the council, HPD will be offering financing to bring these illegal units into compliance in exchange for affordability. And HPD will allocate six million in city capital to fund the rehab work. The preliminary budget provides as well two million for contracting with community-based organizations and 65,000 for a new project manager to facilitate the program. Council Member Espinal has been a critical partner in these efforts and we look forward to bringing this program to fruition. Next, I'd like to talk about our work um, in helping the most vulnerable in our city. So in all of our work, we have prioritized the need to provide pathways to permanent housing for our city's homeless, creating more affordable housing for our growing senior population and ensuring that there is more housing accessible to New Yorkers with disabilities. Stable housing is a determinant of so many crucial social outcomes, including education, health, economic advancement. In order to address an aging New York, HPD, for instance, created the new Senior Affordable Rental Apartments Program, or SARA, in 2014 to spur the production of senior apartments. We also expanded SCRI, Senior Citizens Rent Increase Exemption, and DRE, Disabled Rent Increase Exemption Programs, to freeze the rent for more of our seniors and people with disabilities living in rent-regulated apartments. We have introduced a number of targeted programs to specifically address the, specific, the needs of the formerly homeless, which we know has been a priority for the speaker and for so many members of the council. We appreciate um, your leadership to support these units um, in your districts and to recognize the importance across all the five boroughs. We are building permanent housing for the formerly homeless at a faster pace than ever before, creating more than approximately 7,200 units since the beginning of this plan in 2014. For the first time, we have also required homeless set-asides for all projects financed through our most popular new construction programs and have added a city rental assistance program, freeing up Section 8 and other federal rental assistance dollars, which of course are scarce, to serve more New Yorkers. Moreover, the mayor's 2015 commitment to create 15,000 supportive housing apartments over 15 years, using a proven effective model that saves public dollars, will help fulfill the city's moral commitment to house New Yorkers in need. And under uh, HNY New York thus far, we have financed over 3,000 supportive housing units, which include units funded under um, NYC 501515 and prior administration's housing plans. Next week, I know that Commissioner Banks will talk about what the city has achieved with the scattered site supportive housing program. So where we are in terms of Housing New York and what that means for uh, the way forward. The four years into our Housing New York plan, we have set a new pace and established a new baseline for how affordable housing can and should be built in New York City. As a result, in November of 2017, we accelerated and expanded our plan to create and preserve 300,000 homes by 2026, two years ahead of schedule, and with 100,000 more homes than initially planned. We release an update to the plan, Housing New York 2.0, that offers a suite of new programs, partnerships, strategies to help thousand more families and seniors afford the rent, buy a home, stay in the neighborhoods they love. Those new pro programs include, one, Senior First, which is a slate of initiatives that will double our goal to serving 30,000 seniors over the extended 12-year plan. Second, Neighborhood Pillars, a new fund to help not-for-profits purchase and protect buildings with rent-stabilized units. Three, the Mitchell Lama Reinvestment Program, an effort to anchor affordability of the existing developments for the next generation. And our Open Door and Home Fix programs, two programs to help more than 2,000 families own a piece of New York and make repairs to their homes. This expanded housing plan reflects the urgency of the needs on the ground and a vision for the kind of city that we want to be. The path forward is about doubling down in our commitment to tackle the affordability crisis that threatens the health and well-being of families, as well as the competitiveness and equity of our city. Despite the threats we are seeing from the federal government, and there are many, this is how we will ensure that the greatest city in the world will remain what it is and what it was always meant to be, which is a place for everyone. So as I've outlined, this administration is pushing forward on the broad goals of Housing New York with renewed energy. The important work already accomplished has not been done alone, of course. 
And although I've said this before, I really do want to thank the City Council for the leadership and the collaboration that has allowed us to achieve this great progress and the far-reaching policies far beyond the numbers. We recognize that countless community-based organizations, not-for-profits, local leaders, interested stakeholders who represent invaluable partners to us in this work. As mentioned, we do this work in the face of very real threats. There is a war being waged on public and affordable housing across this country. All of us need to work together if we are to be successful in fighting for the resources we need to ensure the affordability and equity of our city. For example, the land use process is critical in our efforts to build and protect affordable homes and to reach our most vulnerable residents. The City Council is a critical and necessary partner in this process. We understand, of course, that it takes some back and forth to get to yes in land use pro proposals, but it is worth taking a step back and recognizing that each project is a critical battle in confronting the city's affordab affordability crisis. The administration and the council both share the responsibility in making sure we just don't lose sight of what's at stake. In addition, during these uncertain times with our federal government, your advocacy on a fully funded housing and urban development or HUD budget will be critical. I appreciate all of what you are doing to ensure that we continue to create new opportunities for housing strapped New Yorkers at every turn. Thank you again for the opportunity to discuss HPD's pathway to a more equitable and fair New York. Um, thank you for all that you do in partnership with us and uh, look forward to answering any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Commissioner. I want to uh, point out that we've been joined by Council Members Rosenthal, Perkins, and Levine. Um, we're going to get right into the questions. Um, I'm going to begin with just a few questions, and I know my colleagues have other hearings they have to attend, and I'll be allowing them to ask their questions before they leave us. Um, as, it, as I mentioned before, you know, our concern about the 750 million or 86 percent of HPD's total expense budget is supported by federal assistance programs. This funding helps HPD carry out programmatic activities, which include development, code enforcement and repairs, and housing placements through its Section 8 program. Because future funding levels are highly uncertain, the committee continues to be concerned about potential budget cuts for essential housing programs, especially in light of Trump's budget request 2019 and will reduce federal funding for vital housing programs by 18 uh, percent. I'll start with the uh, Section 8 program. As of February 2018, HPD administers uh, approximately 39,900 Section 8 vouchers, and the average subsidy per voucher holder totals $1,000 per month. The fiscal 2019 preliminary budget provides $493 million for Section 8 program. Are the current federal funding levels adequate to support all existing voucher holders? One. Two, are current federal funding levels adequate for the issuance of new vouchers? Three, what is the estimated impact of Trump, Trump's budget request on the Section 8 program? Okay. Um, thank you for those questions. Um, of course, you are correct that our Section 8 programs, our rental assistance programs generally, rely on the federal government. Um, currently, um, the funding um, levels that we have um, are sufficient to support the existing number of vouchers, which is about 40,000. Um, I'll remind the Council that we are operating under a continuing resolution for FY18 um, that hopefully over the course of the next few weeks there will be more clarity um, about the passage of essentially the appropriations bill um, in order to finalize those numbers. But at the levels that we see now, which is essentially renewal, uh, essentially funding that is similar to um, the previous um, fiscal year, it's sufficient to support current vouchers. Um, in terms of new vouchers, how we do it is that in any given year, because of the caps um, that are set in terms of, of um, wholly new vouchers, um, the new vouchers that we issue are based on um, renewal funding that we have. 
and that is um, tied to um, essentially the attrition rate that we have um, for our existing vouchers, which is about 4%. Um, and so in any given year, we're able to um, issue approximately 1,500 um, quote unquote new vouchers. We expect that to be the case as well um, for this year. Um, I will um, uh, certainly acknowledge um, that President, Trump, President Trump's um, uh, proposed budget um, not just anticipates um, uh, cuts to um, Section 8, but also the elimination of major programs like CDBG, like HOME, that fund so much of our work. Um, the good news, we were in this um, situation last year. His original budget had a lot of um, the same threats, but due to the extraordinary advocacy of housing groups and municipalities across the country, really bipartisan support for the types of programs that are funded by um, the rental assistance provided by HUD, by CDBG, by HOME, um, we have been able, and the continuing resolution um, demonstrates that, um, preserve those levels of funding. So we'll remain vigilant um, this year and in the following years to ensure um, that there are no cuts to these budgets to the extent that they um, uh, do materialize. Um, then, of course, the magnitude and timing of those cuts um, will be examined, but it will be our goal, as it, al it always has been, to ensure that we minimize the impacts to New Yorkers who depend so much on our programs and services. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to stay kind of in this realm, but skip over a little bit. I, uh, in our preliminary conversations, um, I cited how important it was for districts like mine to have pathways to home ownership. Um, so obviously the larger context and larger conversation is about uh, deep affordability and affordable housing, but I think we have an opportunity to walk and chew gum at the same time. So we can, we can help you know, potential homeowners on pathways. So I just have uh, some questions, even in the Section 8 program around home ownership. Um, so just uh, of the housing starts to date, how many uh, are for home ownership opportunities? Yeah. Um, to date, under Housing New York, we've announced um, 13,000 um, uh, home ownership starts. That's about 14% of total production. And how many down payment assistant loans have been issued to homeowners citywide? Approximately 470. So my only question is, so, so in doing the research and in working closely with your office, I realize that these programs do exist. Uh, what's the methodology for getting uh, the information about their existence out to uh, the city and, and potential homeowners? Right. Um, so first I'll say that we share, Councilman, your commitment to making sure that the housing plan not only addresses the affordability crisis um, that is faced by renters in the city, but also provides opportunities for um, uh, future home buyers in the city because wealth creation um, in neighborhoods across the, uh, across the five boroughs um, is certainly um, a goal of ours and is um, critical to ensuring that we're really strengthening um, each and every neighborhood and providing such opportunity, which is why 14%, as I mentioned thus far, in Housing New York um, uh, uh, is comprised of home ownership housing starts. It is also why we have in the Housing New York 2.0 plan um, announced new home ownership programs, including Open Door, which is a, a, a program for new construction of co-ops and condos for first-time home buyers. Um, we actually uh, just announced the first um, project closed under this program, um, as well as uh, our Home Fix program, which will fund home repair through low interest loans for low and moderate income New Yorkers and pair that with financial counseling. Um, you mentioned Section 8. So we've already, we've done a significant amount. We have new programs as specifically related to Section 8. In fact, there are about um, 30 um, Section 8 voucher holders um, who are currently using those vouchers or in the process of using those vouchers for home ownership. 
those, um, those participants are part of a program that we have called the Family Self-Sufficiency Program. It's for Section 8 um, voucher holders where a program where we have job training, career planning, case management, and have also established a pathway for those individuals um, to um, generate savings. We essentially put those savings in an escrow account as their income rises because of uh, employment opportunities made available due to the services I mentioned before. Um, so it's a, it's a modest program, um, but what we have found that it is a good way to target home ownership within Section 8 um, because those participants um, aside from um, getting additional assistance, um, in order to qualify, you would still need to be able to um, uh, qualify for a mortgage, make a down payment assistant, make the uh, down payment on the home. And so it, we think it is a, um, a strategic way to um, pair um, a, a Section 8 um, with our home ownership goals. And of course, we'd be more than happy to um, talk through the, the specifics of um, what we have learned through that program um, and ways we can um, provide even more opportunity, awareness, and otherwise about that and all of our other home ownership uh, services. So as usual, Commissioner, you, uh, we have a history of you uh, getting way out in front of me in my line of questioning. But I'm going to ask this question just so it's on the record. I think you, you answered it. Um, but when we did our research, we found that that program existed, existed that we had no idea that there was a, a way to use Section 8 vouchers uh, for, for home ownership. And in other parts of the state, it was happening. So if you just indulge me, I'll ask my question uh, as it was stated. Uh, New York State Homes, well, HCR administers a Section 8 voucher home ownership program where Section 8 vouchers assistance is available and being used towards home ownership. <clears throat> the statewide average monthly voucher assistance payment is currently $725. As of October 1st, 2017, HCR has closed on over 526 homes statewide. So uh, outside of the city limits, it seemed as though the program was being used more vigorously. Mm -hmm. um, we understand that the, the market allows for that, right? Because in my district, you know, there are homes that are $3 million, and obviously a, a, a Section 8 voucher would be uh, not as helpful in that instance. So uh, the idea of co-ops and condos being a way to build equity and transfer wealth and those kinds of things, it, it's important. So I'm just glad that you do see a pathway in the city because at first glance it didn't seem as though the city was taking advantage of the program that the, that's being taken advantage of statewide. So for example in Long Island um, I know that the program is very active as well as in some upstate uh, parishes it's, it's, it's being used. Um, but you found you have found a way through co-op and condos uh, potentially to use the Section 8 program for home ownership? Um, we found a way by pairing it with the family self-sufficiency program. Um, because of the differences in the real estate market, of course, here in New York and, and compared to other parts of the state, um, I think there will, uh, there will be limitations to how much that can be scaled. Um, we found some success um, with um, family self-sufficiency, um, but are uh, be, um, more than happy to um, explore ways where that can be deepened either within the family self-sufficiency program um, um, or of course to advance any other home ownership ideas and programs um, that provide a pathway for wealth creation for um, New Yorkers. Is, is that uh, the family self-sufficiency program, is that a federally funded program? Yes, it is. So we should probably have a larger conversation about making sure that there's viability and expansion of that program even from a city level, I'd be very interested. We in would be more program. than happy to do that. We've, um, in fact, in all of our advocacy um, over the course of the last year, given the threats in Washington, um, have both um, highlighted the success of um, that program and also you know, think there is um, potentially an opportunity um, given um, at least the rhetoric that we hear from D.C. Um, about um, the focus on self-sufficiency programs. Um, but we need funding for all of the federally funded programs in order to continue to do our work. 
So I'll, I have more questions, but I'll, on my second round, I'll come back. I'll allow my colleagues. I want to welcome uh, both Council Member Rivera and Council Member Joni. Uh, and we'll begin with my colleagues. Uh, first, uh, Council Member Cabrera. Thank you all so much, Mr. Chair. Welcome, uh, Commissioner. Thank you for an update on all of the great things uh, you have been able to accomplish. Uh, pretty impressive uh, in light of the fact that we have a lot of people who are in desperate need of affordable housing. So thank you uh, for that. I wanted to follow up with uh, uh, Chair's uh, question. And how many of these um, uh, co-ops and condos are in the Bronx that are, are being made available? Um, so I would be happy to um, provide, um, as a follow-up to this hearing, the, the borough breakdown of um, our home ownership um, units. Um, but what is certainly true just in general with the Housing New York numbers is that, um, a, um, in fact, the largest proportion um, of starts, of housing starts, have been in the Bronx, a total of uh, 29,000 out of the 87 that we've financed thus far, um, and we'll, we'll follow up specifically on home ownership um, in the Bronx and in your district, sir. Yeah, if you could please let me know because it, it, it will follow logic. Uh, the Bronx is still the most affordable place to uh, purchase land and, uh, and buildings that it will make sense uh, that, that would be so. Uh, I want to move on to Homeless Shelter Repair Squad. Um, if you could give me an update on Sarah's place in Jerome Avenue, uh, we have a roof that is way overdue. I believe they need $11 million uh, for repairs. Uh, it's leaking from what I understand. I had an opportunity to visit a couple of weeks ago. Uh, do you have plans uh, to include uh, funding in this budget? It's a, it's a sh a currently a shelter. Yes. Um, so we work very closely with um, DSS, DOB, and, and, and other relevant sister agencies in what you just mentioned, the Homeless Shelter Repair Squad, to conduct the types of um, inspections and to make sure that the conditions are correct. I am not familiar with that particular shelter, but can assure you that we will follow up specifically about what the uh, Emergency Repair Squad has seen and to the extent that there are issues, we'll work closely with our partners to make sure they're addressed. Okay, thank you so much. And, um, you know, uh, we always, uh, in the city, we're always looking uh, for partners to build affordable housing. And one of uh, my experience have been one of the places that we really have not tapped in in a substantial way is churches. Uh, who own a substantial amount of land. City, they've been around from the very beginning of, of the founding of the city. Uh, and so I'm curious to know, do you have special funding? Have you been able to work out uh, some of the kinks that sometimes people uh, relate to separation of church and state? Mm -hmm. uh, how do you put in these packages together um, so we could build affordable housing on top of, of churches? Yeah. Um, so we agree and have, um, in fact, um, advanced a number of programs um, with faith-based organizations um, because in many instances they do um, own a lot of real estate um, but have not had previous development experience. Um, and so just to name um, a few different strategies um, that we have implemented um, and always um, happy to do more. So first, just in terms of some statistics, um, since the start of Housing New York, we financed the creation of close to 700 um, units of affordable housing over seven projects with faith-based organizations as development partners. And there are about a dozen uh, more expected to close in this fiscal year and the following fiscal year. In order to build the pipeline and also create the types of partnerships so that um, faith-based organizations uh, are able to um, ascertain what those opportunities are and do it in a way um, where they are protected and can be good partners, two things that we've done. One is established um, a, uh, a list of owner's reps and individuals, organizations 
who have experience in real estate so that as faith-based organizations come to us, um, they may not have the real estate expertise, we have a pre-vetted list of organizations and individuals and can make that marriage. Um, second, um, and this has been an exciting program um, for us, is a program called the New York Land Opportunity Program. We work very closely with LISC, an intermediary, of course, for um, like community-based organizations, and they have worked with several um, uh, faith-based organizations in building um, the capacity, um, providing technical assistance, but also just recently then um, assisted in um, helping the faith-based or faith faith -based organizations release requests for proposals for their land, um, and will help them in um, uh, um, reviewing those submissions. Um, and so those are um, at least three different approaches that we've had, um, and, and that's in addition to a number of events um, that we have um, also hosted in conjunction with many partners um, where we've gathered faith-based organizations to tell them about our work. If there are either specific faith-based organizations or other approaches that you'd like us to pursue, we'd be happy to do it. Well, I'm just uh, very happy to hear that you have a plan and uh, that you already have it into motion. Uh, I'm looking forward uh, to seeing these joint ventures uh, take place. Uh, because uh, it's an un untapped source. And I could tell you, having gone through it myself, uh, outside of HPD, um, it does require an expertise, a level of expertise, and making sure that both sides you know, truly benefit. Okay. Uh, my last question is in regards to your $6 million pilot program in East New York for basement renovations to bring them out to code. Uh, what are the plans uh, for uh, expanding that program uh, throughout uh, New York City? And it is that reflected in this budget? Um, yes, um, it is. So we're very excited about the pilot program that will um, be implemented in East New York. Um, one of the commitments um, uh, pursued um, as part of the East New York Neighborhood Plan. Um, the idea, and in, um, certainly a lot of credit to Council Member Espinal for helping us in shaping this pilot program. Um, the, we hope to launch this by the fall. Um, we have um, funding um, both in the capital and in the expense budget in order to um, launch the pilot, including um, I think approximately two million for community-based or a community-based organization that will assist us, funding for a project manager, as well as six million in the capital budget um, in order to um, provide financing um, for homeowners um, who uh, hopefully will avail themselves of this new pilot program. It will launch in the fall, but the tenant um, support unit as part of the mayor's office will actually start the door knocking um, in East New York uh, this spring to ascertain interest in the program. And then we also have to, um, we'll be working very closely with the city council to pass um, legislation before the program launch, which essentially um, will allow us to make targeted code improvements um, so that the, the pilot can get off the ground. It is our hope that through the experience with the pilot program, we, um, we learn enough about how the financing needs to work, what the interest level is, what the code changes need to be in order to see how this can be scaled citywide. Well, thank you, Commissioner, and looking forward. I have a lot of interest if you want to bring it to my district uh, for the second phase. I'm more than open uh, to collaborate and working together. Thank you so much again, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the town that you're left. Yeah, no, no solicitations there, uh, <laughs> Council Member. No, I was just teasing. Um, uh, Council Member Rosenthal. Thank you so much, Chair Cornegy. Um, and Commissioner, it's always great to see you. Thank you, Thank you. for all your hard work on behalf of tenants. Uh, and that's what I'm gonna focus my two questions on. First, um, do you feel you have enough uh, inspectors, HPD inspectors, to respond to tenant harassment complaints? 
Um, currently, um, that our headcount for inspectors is about 350, um, and what in in addressing tenant harassment, there's certainly all of the tools that we bring to bear. Um, for which currently, although it's always a yearly conversation to make sure um, that we are always at the forefront of what is um, in many ways, you know, the heart and soul of, of the agency's work is protecting tenants against um, harassment and holding landlords um, accountable. Um, but between the, our inspectors who make sure we're enforcing the code bring the um, uh, other parts of emergency neighborhood services that bring housing litigation cases, um, new tools that we have, certification of no harassment for which we have new funding, predatory equity um, uh, watch list that will also launch. But currently we have the resources and the new programs to stay um, hopefully ahead of the issues. I'll also mention, however, that we don't do this alone, right? We do this together well, with Task Force. I'm and about to get to that, okay. if you can hang tough for one second. How many vacancies of the 350 budgeted positions? Um, I will get you this, uh, maybe we can find it over the course of this Do you hearing. think it's over 10%? Um, it's about 32 of the 348. So around 10%. And um, are those positions frozen or are you, is it easy to hire up on those jobs? Um, w what we have. Because um, I know there's a hiring freeze. No, that's, that's right. Although the inspectors and funded by CDBG, um, critical to health and safety right of okay. the city, we've had great, great cooperation in getting those filled. Great, so let's talk about the connection to the Department of Buildings for one second. When, would you, do you think it's fair to say that when some of your inspectors go out that um, of all the violations that are issued, right, in big cases, some are from the fire department, right, that might come in, some might be from the health department or DEP, but is it fair to say that Department of Buildings violations are, are the most in terms of violations issued by inspectors um, when you look at the sort of package of violations, uh, you know, affecting tenants' lives in their homes? Well, I, I, I wouldn't want to make a generalization. Every building is different in terms whether it's a violation of the housing maintenance code um, or otherwise. Um, but we try, whether it, it, very, very hard with HPD and with our sister agencies, to issue those violations in a way that um, will allow for their correction ultimately to protect tenants. So, do your um since your HPD does the harassment side, but I would posit many of the violations come from the Department of Buildings, do, do your inspectors work closely with the Department of Buildings to make sure those violations are cured? How Do you have a role in uh, encouraging Department of Buildings inspectors to go back out to determine whether or not the violations have been cured, or does that really fall under the purview of DOB? Well, we work in collaboration with them all the time, um, not, not just um, uh, as part of the um, Tenant Harassment Task Force, where in particular, um, the most egregious cases get looked at, investigated, not just by those two agencies, um, but state agencies as sure. well. Sure. No, and I'm familiar with the collaboration, and where I'm going is I think we need more. Um, and I do just want to remind everyone that the mayor signed into law a package of bills last year, and I want to make sure that all the agencies are fully equipped to enforce those laws. Um, you know, in the Department of Buildings, we, we, the, the city uh, signed a bill into law creating an Office of Tenant Advocacy, mm -hmm. which could be an office that HPD works with 
it's not been effectuated mm. in any way. Um, and I think that's a major missing link. Mm. Um, so I'm just sort of putting that out there. You know, there are so many instances in my district where the type of harassment is, is so egregious from a Department of Buildings perspective, but it never lands in the harassment area. And we don't, um, we're not getting, the tenants are not getting the protections they deserve. And that rolls me right into my second question, which is, does H, has HPD ever considered counting the number of apartments saved from eviction as preservation? So when, we, when I look at the preservation that's been done in my district, right, I lose over 400 rent regulated units a year. I've brought in, may, and that's a total of maybe 2,000 so far in my tenure, or sorry, having a little math issue, <laughs> 1,600 to 2,000 in my tenure. Um, we've preserved or through HPD tools, we've preserved or, or brought in maybe 500 units, and I'm stretching to get to 500. Is there any, um, is, any is there any interest by HPD in contemplating counting an apartment that's been saved from eviction and harassment as part of your numbers for preserving affordable housing? So if the goal of the counting is to ensure that we approach the issues with as much energy and, um, and rigor as we need, um, uh, we, I don't think that the, 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 the counting is the way to do that because we already do and there's always room to do more. If there are um, instances of harassment, um, we take very seriously and we will continue to, do, to use every tool that we have to address um, those issues and take each and every one of the success stories there very, very seriously. Um, which is separate and apart, but doesn't diminish the previous work that I m mentioned um, from how we count the units as part of the That's housing right. plan. That's right, and so what I'm suggesting is that there's a missing link, and that we could be taking credit for as a city and be, be um, so determined to keep those homes that we count them. Mm -hmm. And um, I understand by financing a building, refinancing a building, that feels more permanent. But in terms of people's lives and how they're being disrupted, we're missing the boat on the ground. We're just missing the boat. And I know how hard you're working. And, you know, Vito's great. We're going to miss him. But you have Anne Marie. You know, you have great staff. And uh, but unless we hold ourselves accountable about those units, that's why groups that are fighting for affordable housing on the ground, New York Communities for Change, CBS, um, CBH, are, are frustrated because that's where we're missing it. And until we hold ourselves accountable, we're, we're we're not really meeting the demands of people who are losing their homes every day. And, and not just losing their homes, losing years of life of stress because they are in units that are susceptible to eviction. And um, I, you know, I think we have to do more. Well, we certainly share your desire to do as much as the city can. I want it um, to, however, be clear 
that we are, um, while it's not part of the production goals, um, we, most of our headcount, um, a lot of our energy, um, because it's needed, is devoted to making sure that we are um, confronting um, any actions that harass tenants in, especially in rent regulated units, of course, and we have to hang on to each one. Last question, Chair, I appreciate your patience. Would you consider exploring uh, um, some sort of uh, analytic uh, measurement of that success? We're always open um, to finding ways to use data, use metrics, use goals to ensure that we get uh, jointly desired outcomes. And so we'd be happy to um, uh, discuss that with you to make sure that we are um, being as rigorous and ambitious as we want to be in addressing those goals. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Rivera. Hello. Good morning. Okay, so I had a couple questions. I'll try to breeze through it because I'm sure there's other people on stack. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Housing Connect and the, I guess some of the ambassadors that you have. I, I used to work at Good Lower East Side and we were an ambassador in the pilot program and I want a little bit of information on, on how it's going. I know that HPD is in charge of the marketing and that the ads go up at about 60% of completion of construction. Um, but I want to know a little bit about the discretion that HPD has in terms of approving applications once people apply and how much discretion the management company has that is chosen by the developer. Mm -hmm. um, so we um, are very proud of the system that we have established um, that both allows for a streamlined um, and accessible um, experience for um, applicants, um, while at the same time making sure that we have good oversight um, and, um, and compliance um, given the rules for marketing. And so on one hand, and you mentioned them, so I um, would just like to um, ensure that it's on the record. So in terms of accessibility and outreach, there are about 35 housing ambassadors um, who literally fan the city um, working with us to ensure um, that um, New Yorkers are a understand what it means to go through the lottery system. And then we have for particular projects, um, there are marketing agents, uh, many not-for-profit, um, who um, do a fair share of the work in terms of um, uh, the lottery process. Um, however, at the end of the day, um, we have a lot of oversight and we want to make sure that the process has been fair, um, and that includes many um, levels of review, and in particular, as appeals come on board. Um, so if either there are both in your experience, certainly in doing a lot of this work with us over the years, um, are gaps that you believe exist or specific instances of organizations or people um, where you think there is room to tighten up, we'd be more than happy to address that. Yeah, I've received a number of, I guess, complaints from some of the local organizations that they feel like discrimination plays a big role in whether or not they get the apartment. And the financial guidelines are very strict, and, and, and I respect that of, of us having guidelines. But to be like $25 over, $25 under, um, I know that we can't make exceptions for everyone. But with that and everything else that happens when someone doesn't get an apartment, it's been very difficult. And I know there's also maybe a 10-day window for the appeals process, which is also very difficult when you're a working parent. Um, so I'd love to maybe discuss how we can improve the appeals process or just in general the approval process, um, the appeals process and the approval process because I do feel like some management companies, you know, exercise their discretion in a way that is really harmful to some families. We'd be happy to do that. If there are discrimination, however, something we cannot and should not tolerate. And so if that is, um, um, if there are instances of that, would certainly love to um, know about them as soon as possible so we can address it. Um, and as it relates to the balance, it's both of making sure that each step is fair um, 
and trying to um, have the process not be so long that we lose people, um, but at the same time provide um, the sufficient sufficient time for those key areas like the appeals. And so if there's room to improve there, we're happy to explore. Okay, and you mentioned a, a predatory equity watch list launch. So, <laughs> Richie's excited too. Yeah. So um, this is great. I know that we've had people who have been working on this issue for a long time. The public advocate does her own like bad landlords watch list. So can you give me a little bit more information on it specifically? As we know, there are the big bad guys, right? They're, I'm sorry, but they're mostly men. And there, there's some women too. They're, they're, no one's perfect. We had you know a terrible tragedy in our district that was that involved um, some poor managers and, and property mm -hmm. owners. So can you tell us a little bit about it and kind of what is your criteria because there are some landlords who are terrible people who only own maybe two buildings. And then we have the Cromans of the city mm -hmm. who own this huge portfolio. Um, so if you could just give me a little Absolutely. bit. Absolutely. First I'd like to thank um, Council Member Richie Torres for working with us so closely. Um, Thanks on Richie. The predatory equity speculation watch list. Um, that was a, a very good collaboration of getting the, the program of structure to a place um, where um, uh, the goal is to you know, achieve the underlying um, objective of addressing those types of landlords while making sure it was something that was data driven um, and that we can operationalize. So specifically, um, and the, 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 the watch list will launch um, in late October of this year, and it'll be updated quarterly. Um, the idea is to um, publish a list which identifies essentially recently sold rent regulated buildings where tenants are at risk of displacement due to potentially predatory um, um, activity. So what we're going to look for primarily are sales transactions of rent regulated buildings with low capitalization rates, so buildings with sales price is higher than expected when compared to similar market transactions. Um, and in many ways, it's kind of the canary in a coal mine. That's like the leading indicator that something, um, that there's a real threat here and that will allow us and other relevant agencies looking into these issues to keep an eye out and also, of course, tenant advocates and local leaders for what is going on with those particular buildings to ensure that we can get ahead of um, um, any um, illegal behavior um, or um, uh, tactics by that landlord. Uh, I, I want to thank my colleagues for their very substantive and in-depth questions, uh, but we are in serious danger of running over time, so I would ask that going forward we could be as succinct as possible. Thank you, Barry. <laughs> Sorry. And, and with that note, uh, we welcome <laughs> Councilmember Grudenchik. And Council Member Torres. Well, if do, can I ask one more, or should we move on? I'm willing to just talk to the commissioner after this because she's just you're you're you know you were very easy to work with in my very humble experience here at the City Council. Um, I can pass. I was going to ask about Mitchellama, but if you want to cover that, if you if you would consider uh, exercising an opportunity to meet privately with the commissioner, I would she, love to if exercise she oblige that. that. Let's do that. <laughs> All right. Mitchellama is very important to me, period. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Ditto. Council Member Chin. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have a couple of questions, but I can come back for a second round if it's possible. But first, um, I wanted to personally thank you, Commissioner, and your team, um, coordinating also with the team at DOB, helping the residents at 85 Bowery. I know that your staff has been there every day making sure that they can go back home as soon as possible. And I really appreciate um, that coordination effort. And that is something that I think that can be a model going forward uh, when there are buildings that's being vacated, that if agency can work together to really get tenants back. Because we have heard stories where people have to wait years to get back. And if we can get people back as quickly as possible, uh, that is something we should definitely determine to do. Um, my question is that relating to the uh, alternative enforcement program uh, at HPD that um, city council put in about $750,000 uh, and there's like 250 
severely distressed multiple uh, dwelling units, uh, apartment building that are in the program every year. Can you let us know what is the total budget, um, city money, CDBD, uh, CD, uh, BG money that's also in there? And how do you, do you think that program has been successful in terms of getting uh, building fix up back up to co and and having tenant be able to remain in those buildings happy to first i, I want to thank you council member for um, all of your leadership in 85 barry it has been a, a very challenging um, situation but we're committed to finding every way to hold the landlord accountable to making the repairs and more importantly getting the tenants back in their homes as it relates to um, aep we're pulling the specific breakdown um, in terms of the budget, um, you know, we've done um, uh, 10 rounds um, of AP. We are now in um, round 11. Um, and over the years, um, we do believe um, that it has been successful um, because it allows us not just to create that list of the 250 most distressed buildings, um, which is in and of itself um, um, a way to ensure that publicly um, the, 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 the building owners um, um, are kind of made aware um, even more than they already are of the issues with the buildings, but also provides us with very specific tools um, in order to force them to correct those violations. Um, and so um, just to um, give you an example of the 250 buildings in round 10, so last year, 154 um, are now in compliance and are no longer on the list. The ones who are not yet, we are using every tool that is provided to us through AEP to get them to comply, and that's what we will do um, every year. Um, in terms of the budget for AEP, it's approximately $9 million per year. Um, and almost all of that is um, CDBG federally funded. Great, that's, that's, that is good. Um, also being the chair of the aging committee, I gotta ask senior question. So in terms of the, the mayor's announcement about uh, the new program, uh, HBD Senior First Initiative. So can you uh, give us some updates on and how that program is gonna be rolled out because we have so many you know, hundreds and thousands of seniors on waiting lists for senior housing, and this is really good news. Yes, um, of course, very familiar, not just um, with your interest, but your leadership um, on e uh, um, issues relating to um, our city seniors. And as part of Senior First, when we, so when we revamped the housing plan, as you mentioned, um, we doubled down on our commitment to seniors. A previous goal was 15,000 over the course of the original plan. Um, that has been doubled to 30,000 seniors served over the course of the expanded plan. To date, we financed more than um, 5,500 units um, for um, seniors. Um, that breaks up um, uh, half and half um, in terms of, uh, or f 40 to 60 new construction and preservation. Um, moving forward, we um, will continue to be as aggressive as possible in new construction senior units. Um, that we have a, a term sheet that we um, released last year called SARA. We hope to continue to use um, that to, in order to get new construction units. On the preservation side, um, one of the areas that we're hoping to um, really tap the potential of are the um, uh, to former or current HUD 202s that might be en uh, nearing the end of the relevant contract as preservation opportunities into the future. Um, and then a whole new program um, where we are through our preservation projects going to make the types of enhancements so that seniors can age in place um, in their current homes. And what we found is that a lot of the home modifications um, that can be made um, so that seniors can age in dignity in where they currently live 
um, can, are very cost effective. The lever door handles, the slip resistant um, floors, um, these are the types of, of, of enhancements in our preservation programs where we can use already all of the great literature that's out there together with DIFTA on aging in place, make sure we include those scopes in preservation. And so all of that um, uh, is underway um, because um, our commitment to um, seniors in this city and making sure that they can age with dignity and do um, given fixed incomes and the incredible real estate pressures that they face is um, very strong. Thank you. Uh, Chair, I can come back for second round so that other colleagues can ask questions. Thank you. I believe Council Rivera, Councilwoman Rivera has a quick comment. Yeah, I just want to say, you know, Margaret has been so great on, on fighting for seniors and, and this is this is fantastic news to hear about the new units. <clears throat> when I was providing housing services, the average senior that walked through the storefront that I was in on Avenue B was on SSI, mm -hmm. which means they made maybe ten or eleven thousand dollars a year. And that's really no way to live in New York City, but that was their reality. That and and snap. So, you know, when we're thinking of seniors and where they live and the five flights that they're walking up and the fact that they're there and they're 80 years old, with this new construction and giving the community board benefit, which is great, just really considering the very, very, very low income seniors that are all over our neighborhoods and that have really made these communities so wonderful. I just wanted to say that, you know, making $11,000 a year is already tough. So being able to not have to walk up five flights and not being an able-bodied person and having a city that is looking out for that is really important to us. Um, understood, and it's partly the, the reason why we make sure that um, for the senior projects, having project-based vouchers um, is, um, uh, has been so critical. We'll continue to do that um, in our work moving forward. Thank you, Councilmember Jonah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. Just as a follow-up on the legalizing of the basement apartments, can you be a bit more specific on the approach? Is this a CFO change, or is this going to be a license or a temporary permit that will allow them to rent out these units? And are we taking into consideration the zoning requirements, uh, parking, uh, sprinkler updates to bring these homes, up to, these homes up to code? And will this also alleviate some of the additional expenses from engineering and architects, which have virtually made it impossible mm -hmm. for many of these homeowners to convert these apartments into legal apartments? Great. So I'll start. And um, our Deputy Commissioner, Matt Murphy, who's been the point on um, uh, this pilot, um, should um, supplement um, the, the areas that, that I missed. Um, so we're working very, um, a few things, we're working very closely um, with the Department of Buildings and the Fire Department to understand what are those code changes um, that um, need to be made, can be made um, in a streamlined fashion, and that's the legislation that I discussed earlier, in order to allow for the safe um, uh, for habitability of basements and cellars. And so Matt will, will speak in a second about um, what the, um, the specifics are um, that have been contemplated for that. Our financing program certainly does take into consideration um, that for a lot of um, the, uh, the homeowners and the residents um, that making those types of changes can be prohibitive um, in terms of um, the cost, the, not just the actual construction cost, um, but also the soft costs available, all of the professionals that you mentioned. And so we're structuring a financing program um, that will provide subsidy in order for this to be a financially viable program. And uh, what happens then is in exchange for making that type of subsidy, um, then the um, the tenants in the, the basement apartments, um, it'll be a regulated apartment. And that's what ensures affordability um, over time. Matters, uh, what would you add to that in terms of some of the major contours of the program? Sure, so I think that was a very thorough answer. Um, I would just add that the- uh, I'm sorry, would you just for the record identify yourself? Oh, yes. Um, Matt Murphy, Deputy Commissioner for Policy and Strategy at HPD. Um, so the only thing I would add is that 
the reason the issues you brought up are also why we're approaching this with a pilot program. Um, there's a lot to learn about the um, various issues that owners are likely to face um, and also operationally for the agencies. So things like um, whether or not there will be a, a certificate of occupancy or a special type of alt, modified alt one or something like that, that is gonna be part of the, the pilot program and part of the learning. And what about zoning and up bringing the properties up to code with sprinkler requirements and parking requirements that That's make it. it very difficult for these homes or these properties to even be able to become legal apartments or increase the number of units. Yeah, so that's that's exactly the goal of the pilot is to do that learning. So things like sprinkler requirements, uh, light requirements, second egress requirements, um, all the thing. Our, our primary goal for this program is to make sure that these are safe units, um, but also to do everything we can to create um, an affordable stock, in, and this is an opportunity to do that. Um, and understand, and this will lead into my next question, that certainly um, the more homes is about supply versus demand, and obviously we, the more supply we have, the, uh, sta the more stable rents will be, and I credit you with thinking outside of the box on how we can help bring more affordable units onto the market. But I do, I do hope that the homeowners that participate in this program will be well advised in advance that this apartment will be a regulated apartment. Uh, many of these homeowners are unfamiliar with our rent stabilization laws and uh, would be subjecting themselves to some uh, regulation that they were not experiencing or had to deal with in the past. Which leads me into the next question in preserving and making sure that affordables remain affordable and expansion of SCRI and DRI. Uh, there was a, I had introduced a bill in Albany and I know there's a bill uh, currently working its way through the city council that would be known as the TREE bill. Uh, tenant rent increase exemption program, similar requirements, less than 50,000, but in this regard, half the income would have to go to rent and prevent uh, or would give a rent cap to those families to help them get through this difficult time. These are the most needy of the families. Affordability is um, the goal, making sure that they remain in their homes. The question is, would you be supportive of a similar program for families across New York City earning under $50,000, similar to Dree and Scree, where there would be a rent cap that would not be subject to future rent increases? Um, so we are supportive of um, any new idea that allows us to um, confront the affordability crisis in the city. Scree and Dree, as I mentioned, have been great successes, um, and we have increased enrollment in those programs. Specifically, as it relates to this proposal, and be, be more than happy um, to take a closer look. What we're always trying to balance, and what it, it are the goals of ensuring that it addresses the needs of tenants. Well, of course, um, it also has to be um, uh, financially um, sound and has to make sense given um, the city's overall budget position. Um, but with that idea and any others, um, it's something that we have. Um, we're, we're more than happy to take a look at. Well, financially sound is a concern of mine as well, and it should be for all of us, but this would make assure that society's most vulnerable families, those that are actually living paycheck to paycheck and month to month and at any time can find themselves homeless and on the streets, this would be a way to make sure that we don't allow their we don't allow it to become more difficult as they deal with the hurdles and obstacles, but I'll continue to work on this with you. And my last question, because of the significant role that HPD plays in supportive housing units, and one of the concerns um, of mine is that the borough of the Bronx has been inundated by supportive housing units. We have 41% more than Brooklyn, 13% more than Manhattan, 100% more than Queens, and 99% more than Staten Island compared um, to the number of residents that we have. Now, we know that supportive housing units are necessary. We want to share that responsibility. But what is HPD going to do to prevent the borough of the Bronx from continuing to be inundated uh, by supportive housing? And we know the effects are it, it strains our educational system, it, our uh, uh, health care systems, our um, uh, police force. But more importantly, it takes affordable housing units that would be readily available to Bronx sites by converting them to supportive housing and allowing anyone from the city 
uh, or the state for that matter, to um, uh, live in. Um, Council member, I understand all of your concerns. It's certainly um, a conversation and comments and, and, and concerns that we've heard through the course of doing this work. I do have to mention a few things. One is that supportive housing has been, is a proven model for um, creating permanent housing for those who are the most vulnerable. I'm so fully supportive of it. No, no, please don't misunderstand me. We need to continue to build supportive housing units. My concern is the borough of the Bronx that has an unfair share of those units compared to the rest of the city. Well, I would, I'll say that our, um, in looking at the, um, the pipeline um, and also the, the work, our supportive housing work thus um, to date, um, one key statistic that I'd just like everyone to, um, to take note of is that 43% of the 20,000 or so units financed over the course of 30 years of doing this work actually located in Manhattan even though the borough only contains about 19% of the city's total population. And 30% of those units are in Manhattan south of 96th Street. And so while we work very closely with individual council members and communities because there is, there are concerns about what is called saturation, but um, our commitment to making sure that we're providing permanent housing to the most vulnerable um, uh, is, is incredibly strong and we want to make sure that we do that across the city. Commissioner, I agree with you, but to the detriment of a borough, and those numbers come out of the fair share plan that came out of this council and this body in 2017. Those statistics are the council's and New York City statistics. 41% more than Brooklyn per capita, 13% more than Manhattan per capita, 100% more than Queens per capita, and 99% more than Staten Island. That is an inundation oversaturation of a borough. What can we do to prevent that from continuing to, to occur in the great borough of the Bronx? We want to share the responsibility. We need to be fighting this collectively, and um, this should not be borne by a single borough um, over the rest of the city. And although it's well attended and needed, a fair approach uh, to this is what I'm asking. Yeah. Um, well, uh, the other critical fact about supportive housing um, projects is that um, a large percentage, or 40 percent, 40 to 50, are for um, non-supportive tenants. And so even if um, the, uh, there are more supportive units in any uh, supportive housing projects in any particular area, those are units that both help with uh, very vulnerable populations as well as um, uh, other residents who may not need those services. That's, I think, one important piece that sometimes gets lost in, in the discussion about supportive housing. Um, I do take your point, though, Councilman, generally, about making sure that we're working together as all of these projects move forward um, so that there is equity um, and fairness in, in all of that work. I, and I know that I'm considerate of the time constraints, but I just want to continue this. The borough of the Bronx has the least expensive land. The revenue that is being received by supportive housing shelters across the city is consistent, the same, regardless if they're building in Queens, Brooklyn, Manhattan, or the borough of the Bronx. So contractors and these developers that specialize in this sort of development have targeted the borough of the Bronx because of the low construction costs, understanding that wherever they built this development, they'll receive the same revenue. We need to start discussing the stages and a, ver a revenue that will be paid for these supportive housing units by borough on demand as compared to land acquisition. Otherwise, this will continue to happen in the borough of the Bronx, uh, and I can't see us stopping it or slowing it down anytime in the near future. So thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Torres. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Commissioner, it's always a pleasure to partner with you. Uh, your team, I think Francesc, Matt Murphy, uh, everyone on your team is exceptional. So I just want to, I've enjoyed Thank you. the collaborations. I agree. For the record. Um, and I'm notoriously critical, so that. <laughs> so your administration has the challenge of creating substantially more affordable housing than your predecessors did with substantially fewer resources. 
right? You're grappling with the declining value of LIHTC, the rising cost of construction, the city's revenue shows signs of declining. The mayor committed in, in October to creating 300,000 units of affordable housing, creating and preserving. But then in December, the Congress enacted tax reform, which is likely to have an impact on the value of LIHTC, if it hasn't already. Uh, do you think the 300,000 goal is, remains feasible in light of tax reform and in light of all the forces that are conspiring against cost-efficient affordable housing development and preservation? Yes, I do, uh, which isn't to diminish the threats that are coming from Washington, D.C., um, certainly with um, the expanded plan. You know, the city has made an unprecedented um, an allocation of resources on the city capital side. Um, with the cut in the corporate tax rate, um, we had, have already seen um, um, drops in um, uh, LIHTC pricing. However, we're, we are being as um, creative as possible in dealing with any gaps that might have arisen on a project-by-project -project basis. Um, and then in general, um, because affordable housing continues to leverage um, other, um, other dollars in a way that really in any other industry you really don't see, um, we hope to continue to exploit that in the best possible fashion. I'll also mention that while there are threats coming from D.C., um, that there has been, and much because of the local leadership, including um, yourself, Councilman, um, there's been so much bipartisan support for a lot of the programs. And even after the uh, uh, um, tax reform, um, key components like private activity bonds were preserved, and there's already a tremendous amount of energy around the Affordable Housing Improvement Credit Act, which for the first time in a long time will hopefully bring hundreds of millions of dollars kind of back into the system in order to mitigate against um, any, um, any gaps that may arise um, because of um, the drop in the corporate tax rate. So the plan that we have um, uh, I believe is still feasible, but requires all of us to um, be as vigilant as possible in protecting those pieces um, that make it feasible over the long run. Have you quantified the loss of affordable housing funding from the declining value of LIHTC? So the, the estimates are that because of the, the, the um, drop in the corporate tax rate, that that um, likely will result in about $200 million um, and as a loss to um, uh, in any given year. Um, but we are, um, and thus far, and will continue to do this, kind of manage those um, potential reductions on a project-by-project -project basis. So um, even with the rumor of the corporate tax rate dropping and, and tax reform, yeah. we already saw drops in pricing, right? That started around this time last year. Do you, do you year. expect it to decline even further? Um, well, we... Uh, we work very hard in negotiating each deal yeah. to make sure we're getting good pricing. But, but I mentioned that point because the rumors started, we started to see drops, right. but we made record numbers in terms of production for the calendar year. And so even with those, with the threats out there, we were able to find a way in managing the budget and striking good deals to get to a level of production since the beginning of time at HPD. I mean, it would, it would seem to me that the loss of $200 million every year would seem to seriously undercut the goal of 300,000 units, but, but I'm, I, I don't know for sure. You said there's legislation that would bolster the tax credit. Yes, on the federal side. So would it generate enough um, yes. funding? It's, okay, so what, what, yeah, what are the, the estimates? The estimate is that it would generate $500 million. Um, so, that would so a net increase bring of it back to the million. city. Okay. That's correct, and it would be, um, and it currently has quite a bit of bipartisan support. It's one so of the. So what are what are the prospects for passage? Um, well, um, as part of um, the omnibus spending bill that's being um, negotiated right now, um, there are you know uh, signs that are positive um, that this is back in the equation. It has support from both sides of the aisle. The same was true um, as part of the, the tax reform, and so um, it's hard to count your chickens um, before they hatch, right? And we all, but with, there is tremendous support across the country, um, and any support that the council can provide in um, 
supporting the uh, Affordable Housing Improvement Credit Act would be much appreciated so that we know that um, there's much more certainty about the funds. All right. So your goals remain the same, but when we lose funding from the federal government, we have to make up the difference with city subsidy. So we're putting in more and more subsidy to create the same level of affordable housing. Ha ha does HPD track the amount of city subsidy per unit that we have spent from year to year to see the increase? Well, I wouldn't, one, I wouldn't say that we're making up for it j uh, for all of the changes just by um, ad adding additional city capital. Um, we are finding ways in each project to be as, um, to stretch the dollar as much as we can um, in order to get the same number of units um, with the resources um, that we have. Um, we, you know, s certainly um, uh, monitor and track um, the spending um, in any given but, but I just want to be, we, we're program. spending more per unit than we have historically, is that? Well, it, it depends on the program. The average, you're looking, spending more per unit given that our programs run the gamut from uh, first-time home buyer down payment assistance to new construction projects that are, of course, much more costly. It is um, uh, not uh, very easy to say we're spending more per unit. Um, we have seen there uh, more was committed, more was spent in the last fiscal year, but that's partly because we had record-breaking numbers. There have been rising costs, and we'll we'll address them. But I, I think the sustainability of the plan in the long term. Have is you still but intact. have you done the cost per unit analysis that I described earlier? Well, it, it based on each program. We in each program, know, apples to apples from year to year. Well, we we certainly know what um, is is spent per program, um, and. Um, and track that and understand and understand trends. Um, two other things worth noting in the past year to the extent that, that more was, was spent is the addition of the 1.5, 1.9 billion um, because we as a city wanted to make sure that we reach deeper levels of affordability. So I, I suspect you read the New York Times article. Uh, I believe the heading was de Blasio bolsters affordable housing, but at what price? And there was a startling, I was not aware of this, um, data point in the article indicating that we have spent, what, $3.4 billion in foregone tax revenue relating to affordable housing or residential housing. What are, what are the variables that account for the $3.4 billion that we spent? Is that mostly 421A? Is that Article 11? What's the lion's share of yeah, the three point four we'll, billion dollars? We'll, we'll follow up with a specific um, breakdown um, of of that number. Of course, I did read the article, um, and, and uh, what I'll say is that we are um, making sure that we're not just talking the talk about addressing the affordable housing crisis. We are walking the walk, and we've made. Um, uh, historic commitments because the affordability crisis in this city is so dire. We've also collectively as a city made a commitment to making sure that we are addressing the most vulnerable, um, the lowest income New Yorkers and doing so in an environment where there are rising construction costs, um, where pricing has has gone down. Um, and so um, we're creating at a record pace and the, the investment that we're making we don't think of it just as but the investment that we're making. You know, no, no one questions your investment, but we, we want to be parsimonious with every dollar we spend. Ab absolutely. 3.6, 3.4 billion in operating, this is not capital, it's operating funds, it is an astonishing number to me. Uh, I'm wondering, is that an accurate number? number and that's only residential housing, not to mention economic development. Is, is, that, is that an accurate number, number one? And what's the single greatest driver of foregone tax revenue when it comes to residential housing. Right. No, I understand the question. I'd like to follow up okay. after scrubbing. I haven't, um, I did not calculate that number myself, and so we'd be happy to dig into it. Um, but the, the, the tax exemption programs are the ones that you mentioned that are typically used. 421A for and Article, Article 11 are Article. the largest? Or? They, are, they are some, but I'd, we will clarify what percentage they make up of um, a typical project. Would H and this would be my final question on Article 11. Does HPD provide Article 11s to affordable housing developments whose targeted incomes are higher than the median income of a community district? Um, that's a good question. I don't know if, if 
Molly, our Deputy Commissioner, Molly Park, our Deputy Commissioner for Development can provide clarity on it. Hi, Molly Park, Deputy Commissioner for Development. Um, we use Article 11 as a very important housing preservation tool that includes where, so there are buildings that are there with occupied tenants. The building may look representative of the community district that it's in. It may sometimes look somewhat um, different than the community district, but if the building is there, we certainly want to preserve it. We want to preserve the people who are in place. Um, we also use Article 11 in our uh, mixed income new construction programs in those where we are actively trying to get a wide array of income bands into a building, right? So a mix and match project that goes from a homeless set aside plus a 30% AMI tier all the way up through a moderate income. It's not going to qualify for 420C, which is the exemption that we use for projects that are at least 70% low income housing tax credit eligible. Um, in some cases, those may or may may not look exactly like the neighborhood that the building that the building is going into. Um, we think income providing income diversity, providing opportunities for people to stay, opportunities for people to move, is consistent with our housing policy. It's consistent with our fair housing policy, um, and and it is a valuable asset to the community. So I take it that's a yes that you might be. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, and I understand the value of mixed income, but, but are there developments where majority of the units might be higher than the median income of a community district? And are, because I, I, I would have some concerns about subsidizing, subsidizing that. If we're, if we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars a, a year subsidizing affordable housing units that are less affordable than the median income in the community district, that seems a questionable use of public resources to me. But. So the concept of median income in the community district, I think, is it's an important one, but it also is very nuanced. In a district where you have a lot of public housing, for example, I'm not going to get into some of the larger NYCHA issues, but, those, but that is a population that is largely extremely low income, but also from a rent burden perspective, um, they are not facing rent burden issues, right? So there are... Again, I'm not touching the larger NYCHA issues, but, but um, from a rent burden and a housing affordability perspective, that is not their particular challenge. Same thing if you have a population, if you have a district that has had a lot of affordable housing development already, if you've had uh, a, a neighborhood where there has been a lot of, there, a number of naturally occurring retirement communities where people have been in place, they are there, but they may have very low incomes today. Um, we want to be able to bring in a development that may not look exactly like that. The other thing, and I, I think the fair housing concept one is very important, if we only build to mimic exactly what's there today, I, I think that presents... Well, no, I'm not proposing, but I'm, I'm wondering whether the market can finance those developments on their own, right? If you're... Yeah, I, I'm not clear why we have to subsidize units at 165% AMI, right? We, oh, Shouldn't, the that, market should be able to do it on its own. I, that's an easy one. We do not subsidize. So how, how high, do you, when it comes to Article 11, how high do you go? Uh, we, Article 11, the legis, legislatively can go to 165. We, the city of New York, subsidizes with ca our capital subsidy, caps out subsidy at 130% of AMI. Um, and when we are doing units, subsidizing units at 130% of AMI, we are doing that generally so we can get a cross-subsidization opportunity or in some of the home ownership projects that are pri primarily moderate income. Okay, that's the extent of my questioning. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Thank you, Councilmember Gridentry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, two uh, fairly quick questions. With regard, Commissioner, uh, to basement apartments, and I know it's a, an experimental idea in uh, Councilman Espinal's district, I believe. Um, does that require any changes to zoning? Does it? Well, part of um, uh, th in doing the pilot, the, the idea is to identify those changes. We know on the code side, there are targeted changes that will need to be made. But on zoning, have those been identified? Matt can clarify. I wouldn't think it would because, you know, the zoning generally is the same for one and two family homes. It's not until you get to mm -hmm. multiple level. 
Yeah, our goal is to not change the zoning for the basement pilot. Our goal is to work within the housing maintenance code, the building code, fire code. I have a district that consists of largely single family homes. I'm gonna watch this experiment very carefully because our schools are bursting at the seams and I do not know where we would put those additional children. Um, in their other questions that go along, electricity, uh, sewer, water, all those kind of things. So we'll be watching that very carefully. Uh, secondly, because I know we're going uh, quickly here, um, with regard to all the billions of dollars that would be expended, I, I asked this question of, uh, at the recent hearing we had on, on NYCHA, of, chair, uh, of the chair of NYCHA, and uh, I had asked whether or not some of the monies that we are expending uh, to build affordable housing in this city. It's, it's the most ambitious project uh, since the Koch administration, and I'm old enough to remember when driving along the, the Cross Bronx Expressway looked like a war zone. Um, I can remember those buildings. Uh, it was quite uh, ugly and, and very, very sad. But I'm also concerned that we are not devoting enough resources to NYCHA. I know you are not the commissioner for NYCHA, but NYCHA is a huge source of uh, affordable housing. I'm a NYCHA alum, as is uh, Councilman Torres and several other members of this uh, council. My simple question is, have you, and I know you haven't been the HPD commissioner since the beginning of Mayor de Blasio's term, are you aware of any conversations that have taken place where some of the monies that are being expended to create uh, newly affordable housing, new housing, would be diverted to NYCHA to repair what we already have so that those apartments don't become uninhabitable, therefore worsening uh, an already uh, egregious uh, homeless problem that we have. Well, I'm of the view, sir, um, and I know that's shared by many, that we have to do both, and we have done both. The administration has made unprecedented capital commitments to NYCHA and has made an unprecedented set of commitments to affordable housing. The need exists. Um, uh, for both the one in 14 New Yorkers who live in NYCHA. The need certainly exists for um, renters in the city. Many I'm, I'm aware of the need. I know it's a great need. I'm just concerned that we're not devoting, for the record, my record, uh, enough of our resources to NYCHA uh, to make sure that they have what they need. I won't ask you to answer any more questions now. I know we're a little short on time, but I just wanted to put that on the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Commissioner, always a pleasure to see you. To see um, you. Looking forward to continue a, a great working relationship on a whole bunch of issues. Um, I do also want to just mention um, the Chair of Public Housing, um, Council Member Alika Samuel, for the work she's doing on um, NYCHA as well. Of course, there's a huge concern. I do also just want to piggyback on Council Member Torres. I, that is a very shocking number. My hope is that the committee will try to dig into $3.4 billion annually that's going on. It's that just a, a minders, that is not an annual number, and we'll follow up with what that is, but before it, con it provides more concern to yes. members of this committee, um, not a number that we generated, but we'll, we'll provide clarity on what exactly it is. That will be excellent. It sounds, sounds a bit high. Um, I also, well, a few things. One, um, you know, in the, last year we, there were some changes in the, the housing plan, which were exciting changes, upped the um, amount that we're going to try to build and preserve, and uh, mandated some affordability in the term sheets. Um, this body has done a lot to uh, push in that direction. Uh, sometimes push a little harder than we thought we had to, uh, but I'm glad that it's um, happening now. I did want to point out my hope is still particularly on the extremely low and uh, very low where you have exceeded what the plan was. Uh, an extremely low is 15 percent, very low 17 percent. Um, the population of extremely low is 25 percent, so my hope is that we can still, can, uh, or roughly 25 percent, still kind of push deeper in. I know it's more expensive. But that's where the population is, and that's where the highest, the smallest vacancy rate is, and my hope is that we continue to keep pushing down. Um, just to piggyback on another question, I, I am concerned that with the, the changes that might come down from the orange man, um, are we still just dedicated to making sure those numbers get reached irrespective of what occurs? Well, we are um, uh, 
given that we are in a continuing resolution, the funding levels thus far based on that um, are positive. Um, and um, I remember very vividly when um, we had this hearing last year, um, there was um, a lot of anxiety over um, what was to occur given the proposed cuts, um, but a lot of great work across the country. The funding levels for all of those major programs have remained flat. We um, will fight as hard as we can to ensure it happens again this time. And to the extent that the situation is different, and they'll certainly work with the council, with OMB um, and others uh, based on the magnitude and timing of any change to minimize, minimize the impact of any um, potential cuts. Um, uh, congratulations on uh, the 421A progress and the, um, the revocations that occurred in terms of um, the uh, tax breaks that were happening without the uh, commensurate affordability. I'm proud to have been one of the voices in helping uh, give you some tools to get that done. But um, thank you for that partnership and thank you for, for, hap for it happening. There's a lot of money being wasted. Um, is there a projected amount the city expects to recoup if the properties fail to be reinstated? Um, we do have that, um, and for about 66 million, thank you, Francesc, um, um, we expect to um, be recouped due to those efforts, and, um, and thank you, um, of course, for um, all of the advocacy um, and the, the support in, um, in being able to st stand up and have the additional staff for the enforcement unit that has resulted in the types of changes um, where we are um, uh, more assured that those um, property owners comply with um, the 421A requirements, um, that they get their final certificates of eligibility, that they register with HCR and doing what they need to do, but the 66 million is the projected amount. Thank you, and shout out to Councilmember Levin who had the bill with me as well. Um, would any such money go to a general fund or would it be dedicated to help fund development of income target housing? Um, it goes to the general fund. Okay. Is there any way we can get some message back to um, the, the mayor? Uh, the, I know HP doesn't have the power to, to do it, but it would be great if that money recouped goes into a fund that would directly impact either building or preserving income targeted housing. Otherwise, um, you know, we're saying that this money was supposed to do that. Um, it didn't, so I think it makes sense to try to get it to a dedicated fund. We'd be happy to share that feedback. Do, do you share my uh, desire to see it happen? Yes. Okay. That's a yes? I didn't. I, I will certainly share your desire to make it happen. Okay. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> um, last year, Social Services, uh, HRA, DHS, announced their plan to acquire through purchase of eminent domain 20 to 30 cluster sites to convert into low-income housing. Is there any coordination uh, with HPD uh, on that plan? Yes, there is extraordinary coordination with HPD on this. As, as everyone knows, um, DSS, as part of uh, the Turning the Tide plan, um, has been very committed to getting out of cluster buildings. And so this, we've been working um, with them in partnership to um, uh, I, I, uh, identify those set of buildings for which um, the acquisition by a not-for-profit and or as a last resort eminent domain can be used in order to create permanent housing um, uh, for, um, for residents. And so uh, nearly daily conversations on this program. All right. Um, and just if you can extrapolate a little more, because always this is always an issue to me of how uh, obviously HPD and the housing plan is working with the homelessness plan. I always kind of see um, fissure there. So is this, can, in general, can you speak about the communication with the other agencies that deal with homelessness and how the two plans are, are working together? Right. Um, and I, there has been and continues to be extraordinary uh, collaboration because we need them to work together. And in fact, they do. The Turning the Tide Plan, an entire section of that, uh, talks about permanent housing and then has all of the elements of um, the Mayor's Housing New York Plan. So they are um, intertwined, not just in um, the language, but in the work that we do. Um, in my meetings, conversations with Commissioner Banks 
happen nearly daily. The coordination on the staff level happens daily, and that has resulted in the production of house, permanent housing for formerly homeless at a faster clip than we've seen before. Almost seven, uh, more than 7,200 um, units financed since the start of the administration. Well, thank you. I hope the coordination uh, continues. I'm glad to hear there's, uh, I hope it's true, daily uh, discussions. I hope that's also true on the um, deputy, um, the deputy mayor level. Um, uh, of course, now we're, we're back up to record uh, numbers when it comes to homelessness, and so we have to do uh, obviously more. Uh, lastly, uh, I think uh, NYCHA residents might accidentally get assistance because of the craziness that's going on with our mayor and our governor on the one-upmanship. One uh, hopefully we can figure out how to do that trick uh, with affordable housing in general. Uh, so if we can figure out some ideas that these two men unfortunately can compete against each other, someone else uh, might uh, accidentally get some assistance there as well. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilmember Machaca. Uh, thank you, Chair and Committee, and hello, Commissioner hello. Tor Springer. Um, so I have a couple questions that are, um, I think, relevant citywide and have a life in the district. Um, the, the Brooklyn Public Library recently uh, went through a really beautiful, I think, conversation about how to redo a library and get incredible and affordable at multiple range uh, uh, AMI apartments. That was, that served as a model, I think, citywide. And I just wanna, wanna get a sense, because there was a lot of creative creative financing that came in to make this, this happen. Uh, what is HPD doing to really think about this model and extending it citywide? Uh, one, for the, the members to hear, but also about how how we can kind of promote that at the, at the district level for, uh, either city-owned property, this was a city-owned property, and our partnerships with nonprofits. Right. Um, thank you for that question. Of course, the Sunset Park Library and the development um, that um, uh, will come to fruition there um, is, a, I think, a great success story, both in terms of engagement and in terms of the actual project that will rise. Um, it is um, a model um, and that we are currently in the middle of, actually, in the Inwood, um, neighborhood um, um, of Manhattan um, having um, released an RFP and just made a designation um, for the Inwood Library um, in partnership with um, the New York Public Library. Um, those are the types of projects that um, both allow for growth and enhancement of um, these tremendous community assets that are the libraries an opportunity to build um, affordable housing um, uh, and also to accomplish other goals as stated by the community through the engagement process. And so I think for both of those, and they, they haven't happened um, uh, quite the same way, right? Each one is different. Um, there are in fact lessons learned about how financing can be braided together, how we can bring in, for lack of a better term, non-traditional partners to, um, and philanthropic dollars, to our affordable housing work, how we can run um, community engagement so that it accomplishes affordable housing, library, and other important goals. Um, and um, and, to the, and the hope is to be able to do that um, uh, in, a more, in a more prolific way. And so I'd be very interested um, in hearing um, your specific thoughts about what, um, what went right and what you think can be transported to others and working with the rest of the, of the city council and the three public library systems um, to um, do more of this um, as is needed or desired by the community. And I think that's a segue to the next question, which is uh, there are only so many libraries and not all of them make sense to uh, to redevelop as sites. And so where else is HB looking for this kind of non-traditional financing model? Are there other um, police precincts, for example? Are there other places that you're looking at right now, actively looking at? Well, I'd say that there is no place we're not looking um, okay. in order to That's fair. identify um, opportunities for affordable housing. Um, the, the properties that are in our inventory right now. Except M zones, right? 
except M zones. Okay, that's uh, on record. Um, that's that, on record. Question, question mark. I th well, I, we're question always mark? trying to balance. Um, in all seriousness, I think that in um, in different communities, um, and I feel like I can say this given um, a, a previous roles that I've served, it's always a balance of making sure that we are protecting, uh, protecting mm -hmm. um, and allowing for growth of critical industrial businesses. We've made very clear for IBZs that there will be no residential development. Um, other M zones outside of IBZs, uh, I won't talk about specific, specific areas, um, but it is um, always a very, very careful and rigorous balancing act and discussion with the community about how best to accomplish the dual goals of economic development and affordable housing. Um, but back to vacant uh, uh, city-owned city -owned lots and or underutilized lots. Um, We've left, in my opinion, no stone unturned about how to use sites, many of which are challenging to create affordable housing. Um, and so whether that are sites that are in our, um, still in our portfolio, and they might be small, so we have to cluster them in order to make them work. Um, sites that might be in other agencies' jurisdiction, where we, of course, are respectful of their municipal needs, um, but to the extent that it, the better use is housing, we've worked very collaboratively to turn that into housing. Um, and for those sites, not even within our inventory, but real estate owned by um, houses of worship, faith-based organizations, finding creative ways um, to build there. Um, and then a whole bunch of new programs, including a very important one called Neighborhood Pillars, because there's only so much land that the city owns where we're putting, um, uh, we're uh, uh, establishing a fund so that not-for-profit organizations can purchase buildings with rent-stabilized but unregulated units for long-term affordability. So just to name a few examples. Yeah, and, and that's, I, I think, a really good uh, overview of the, the multiple uh, kind of programs, and so I'm, I'm thankful for that, and I think hopefully we can, we can, as council members, lead some of that discussion from the ground up through community board and community engagement. Um, uh, switching over to your relationship with DOB and resources that you may or may not be asking for right now in this budget process, uh, I know my district office is experiencing some issues with uh, addressing violations within buildings and the connection between DOB and HPD. And so um, there's a, sometimes these things last for months and a lot happens in that time that uh, causes a lot of concern and impact to, to, our, to our residents. And so is that something that HPD is, is, is focused on now in the budget that we can look at um, to demonstrate a change in that? So um, we are, we're very focused in making sure that for the programs and tools and authority that we and or DOB currently have that we're better coordinated. Um, we're also focused on making sure that the implementation um, of the um, package of bills passed last year, right, standing for tenant safety, that as those get implemented, that we are working very, very closely um, with um, DOB, including um, being active participants in the Construction as Harassment Task Force. Um, those are a few different areas uh, in, and we're, to the extent that there are um, specific additional needs on the HPD end, we are not shy about communicating those to OMB, um, and so that's an ongoing, ongoing conversation. I would like to, though, uh, um, um, uh, invite our um, Acting Deputy Commissioner Anne-Marie Santiago. If there are critical points related to our partnership with DOB or areas for um, um, addressing um, the issues that have been discussed today that you think are, are important to add, please do so. No, I, I think the, I'm sorry, Anne-Marie Santiago, uh, Acting Deputy Commissioner for Office of Enforcement Neighborhood Services. Um, I think the commissioner covered it. We are going carefully over the bills uh, that were passed last year because there's a lot there um, for both agencies. And uh, the coordination is going to be very close. Um, and we will, you know, as we have needs, we can bring those to the commissioner's attention and seek uh, the appropriate um, support. So I, what I heard here was vision is pretty clear. You want to coordinate better. How? 
So I think part of it will be looking at the resources we already use to coordinate. As the commissioner mentioned before, we have the Tenant Harassment uh, Protection Task Force, and there is a division of our office already that works closely with DOB on these issues. Um, so as they kind of roll out their new uh, enforcement program around those bills, I think we'll see where HPD fits best. Um, and again, kind of look at what resources we might need to make that a more effective and efficient um, program. Last question, um, which kind of continues with this question, but really looks at all the incredible comprehensive bills that we passed. Uh, you're looking and reviewing, there's agency coordination. Residents in, in a lot of our districts don't speak English, and there's language access issues for a lot of what's happening on the ground and with the changes. We're doing our best on the ground with our, our constituent engagement, but we're gonna need you to come in with resources. And one thing we keep learning over and over again, it, it's a massive resource intensive um, uh, thing for us to be able to communicate very simple but very important critical messages. Know your rights, I saw that in your testimony. Uh, and beyond. And so what resources are we seeing in the budget requested this year that can address the language access issue for what we just talked about for all the tenant safety work and beyond? How, how are you addressing that and, and really making a difference in this next fiscal year? Right. Um, so language access um, in, in this work given the, um, the very direct contact we have um, with New Yorkers in providing the services um, is uh, extraordinarily critical. Um, for the information of the committee, we have, um, of course, some of the basics, contracts in place for telephone services, document translation, in-person interpretation services. Um, we also have housing ambassadors um, who offer services in 14 different languages, so that's on the lottery side in terms of um, providing information about how to um, access um, affordable units that have come online. Um, through city council funding, um, we've been able to um, increase translations and printed versions of applicant guides. You mentioned Ready, Set, Apply, um, which and a number of our other um, collateral translated into 17 languages distributed via the housing ambassadors, community partners upon um, requests. We also have, um, uh, we just launched a new outreach van um, uh, with, uh, due to the support of um, Bro President um, Ruben Diaz as well as Eric Adams. We will have three by the end of the year, um, but those, um, the, the boots on the ground um, through that effort will also have, of course, access to uh, materials um, in different languages. Um, there, um, there's always, always um, uh, room to um, do better um, in, in this work. And so while we have um, sufficient resources, we believe, for um, the major aspects of our work to the extent um, you councilmen are seeing where there are still gaps, either in particular instances, whether it's community engagement or how enforcement happens on the ground, um, of course, we um, we want to address them. Is your number of increase in dollars for everything you just laid out when you compare it to this fiscal year and next fiscal year? I just want to see if there's an it's increase. Roughly, in it's it's roughly roughly the same. Um, okay. And uh, but if they're um, so you're just saying you're going to do it better and focused. Well, okay. So I, I'm hoping that through the conversations I'm pushing you all to think about how we can actually increase more Understood. dollars. It's just gonna, it's gonna take a lot more money and what I don't wanna do is is not have that conversation now and then later say, you know what, we, we, we could have used some more dollars for this piece. Understood. So I'm hoping that for the next time we come back in the executive budget hearings, we can kind of see uh, either maybe an increase, I'm hoping for an increase uh, and, and a thoughtful kind of response to the, the growing nature of that very difficult, complex, high resource intensive um, objective. Okay, that's it, and thank you so much for your team, including your Deputy Commissioner, Eva Trimble. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Council Member. Before I go back for the second round of questions, starting with Margaret Chen, I just wanted to flag uh, an internal conversation that you have, and I have had about a potential housing stock uh, that's available for low income housing in my district. There are many uh, brownstone owners who have unfortunately had 
um, not great relationships with H HPD as it related to programs uh, decades ago and have voiced um, an unwillingness to enter into uh, contracts with HPD based on the prior relationships. Um, and now those units are becoming a little bit in jeopardy uh, to the shared economy, um, which, which I think is unfortunate. While it's legal uh, to use the shared economy in that instance with three and under in my brownstone and limestone communities, I think there's an excellent opportunity for some people who really would like to see and do their share for affordability in districts that are changing rapidly. Um, I'd hate to miss that opportunity, so I'd like to revisit that at some point uh, about some very viable programs uh, that could be used. Uh, we talked about them, you know, there were, there were programs all through uh, uh, early 2000s, uh, late 90s that allowed for those units that were in private homes to be accessed uh, for uh, either people coming out of shelters or, you know, uh, vulnerable populations. Um, and, and I think it's worth reviewing um, as a potential for affordable housing. We agree, sir. Thank you. Uh, Margaret Chen. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have a couple of follow-up questions. One of them is I'm very excited to see one of these new programs besides Senior First. <laughs> On the list is this Neighborhood Pillars. Um, so there's going to be $275 million set aside, um, a new fund to help nonprofits purchase and protect rent regulated and other buildings. Um, so when is that uh, funding going to be available? So this pro when is this program going to be uh, started right after the budget is passed. So we have we're, we are we have been busy at work since we um, announced the program um, as part of the of HNY 2.0 last fall. Um, I think we've met with over a hundred different organizations, making sure that we structure it properly because we do share your enthusiasm, Council Member, that there's an opportunity here. Um, with the unregulated stock, but for which there are you know, still um, there, there are rent stabilized units to um, have not for profits be able to compete in the private market um, in the acquisition of those buildings so that we can put them into a regulatory um, environment. Um, the good news in terms of standing it up is that we're essentially going to use the infrastructure of the New York City Acquisition Fund, which has been around for a while, as you know, um, been very helpful in providing uh, the type of assist, nimble assistance for the acquisition of sites by private parties for affordable housing development. Um, and so um, uh, with that infrastructure, um, we've already actually you know, started to um, speak individually with certain not-for-profits, not just to get their um, their feedback about how the program can get structured, um, but for what they might already know and see in the market. Over the course of the next few weeks, we'll be releasing a request for qualifications um, so that we can um, essentially start the screening process, vetting process for potential participants um, with the goal of um, over the course of the next year, um, really starting to make our first transactions um, and ultimately um, we believe that this particular program um, will be able to um, will be able to acquire about a thousand units um, per year, um, and so this is um, um, we'd be more than happy to provide um, a specific briefing on this, but is um, I think is going to be a powerful tool as we move forward with the housing plan. Uh, definitely, I would love to have more information. I think I also um, talk with your staff about a particular building. Um, that we've been working with in the, in the community that might be able to benefit from this program. <laughs> Funding I think I available. know which one that is, okay. Yeah, so that's great. Um, following up uh, the comment that Council Member Rivera uh, made earlier about deeper affordability. Um, in the project in my district, Essex Crossing, we were able to work with uh, the South and HPD um, to get some project-based uh, voucher, and that enabled us to, I guess, get at least eight tenants um, with very, very low-income seniors 
um, they were lucky enough to get selected because we had that option um, so that we, we had some uh, units that were set aside for uh, income from zero. And a lot of those, I think quite a number of those were former site tenants. So having a project-based subsidy is really vital. And I would just, looking at a, uh, a testimony that was provided by uh, Enterprise Community Partners, um, so they were talking about creating of a 15-year project-based rental subsidy. I, I just want to you know, uh, get your uh, take on that because what they're saying in their testimony is that that can help um, developer uh, to underwrite deeper affordability. And that might be something that can help um, place homeless family into affordable housing and very, very low income uh, tenants. Uh, so I think I just want to see if uh, HPD have done some research into this and what is the possibility of the city creating um, a rental subsidy program of our own. Right, and so we have, um, I, I don't know the, the report chapter and verse, but um, we certainly through um, our work on, um, um, with DSS and with supportive housing, um, actually have um, a new program on the rental assistance side um, that um, addresses these very issues so that we can do as much as we can um, for um, the formerly homeless. Um, our deputy commissioner might have some um, additional facts about that specific proposal by Enterprise and what we've done or the constraints thereof. Sure. So we have rolled out the New York 1515 program, which is the rental subsidy complement to our supportive housing program. Um, it is very innovative and it is exactly what you're talking about. It is the first city-funded project-based rental assistance program, um, certainly that I know of in New York's history and as far as I know anywhere. Um, it is specifically for supportive housing, but I think it's actually useful on the family side as well because traditionally supportive housing has been entirely funded with Section 8, so with a city rental subsidy program for the supportive housing that allows the vouchers that we have to go into other programs. Um, I'm certainly aware that Enterprise is interested in getting city-funded rental, project-based rental assistance for a broader array of buildings. Um, I think it's something that we are happy to look at. It is, it's a non-trivial cost, so it's something that we do have to look at very closely. But I, I think it's, it's great that um, the city on its own is creating these programs because we have to kind of think out of the box and be creative. We just can't rely on federal government. Um, it's just so unstable there. Uh, but we need permanent affordable housing. Um, I know that we're developing units that are much smaller. Um, fine, you know, but it's just got to be affordable. Uh, so I think that is really exciting and I really wanted to follow up with you uh, more on that and also on the acquisition to see how we can uh, convert some of the buildings that we have in our community to permanent affordable housing. Absolutely. The last question I have is on organizing. Um, even though, you know, oftentimes when we hear about problem uh, at a building, one unit called 311 or they call our office, and I Historically, you know, talking to legal aid and, and HPD, um, HP Action is a very important tool that we can use to help the whole building. Because oftentimes when you have one unit complaining, um, lack of repair, there's probably a problem in the whole building. So I wanted to see if there's a way working with HPD, um, and also tenants oftentimes ask, why couldn't HPD just do the repair, right? Because if you rely on the landlord, it takes a longer time because we still have one building in my district that still have a temporary boiler um, outside the building. And their reason to HPD, I remember a couple of months back was, it's very expensive, um, but give us time. If HPD comes in, we have to pay all that money. But if, H if there are incidents where HPD can do the repair as quickly as possible, why not, right? Um, you could put a lien on the building and then force the landlord to pay. But if there's ways that we can work together with the tenant, uh, with organizers, with council members' office, and utilize HP action um, 
to get a court order repair and then HPD coming in and do the repair as quickly as possible, I think that can really help us uh, preserve a lot more of the rent regulated apartment um, in our community. And, and really helping people get repair. And oftentimes they're immigrants, they're seniors, they really don't know where to go. Uh, but if they are in a building where one person is complaining, then maybe we could get everybody together. Yeah. Um, I'll mention a couple of things, and Anne-Marie, if um, uh, there are important points to add, please do. Um, so we agree with you, um, council member, that there, um, we should find and continue to use every tool that we have to hold landlords accountable. We have, um, uh, of course, in any given year, um, our major programs, whether it's bringing housing court cases, um, the uh, AEP that was mentioned, um, we use every tool that we have to make sure that our enforcement is strong. Um, the emergency repair program, um, as you know, um, has also been an important um, a tool for us, and, and we've used um, both because of the authority given to us, um, as well as funding that's associated, um, as well as trying to get the desired action in the, the most judicious way, and so it has um, traditionally been used, of course, to address emergency conditions um, when property owners fail to address the most immediately hazardous um, immediately hazardous conditions um, and has been a successful one. Um, the instances where we have at times been called to use um, emergency repair um, but don't quite fit are when there are major systems levels um, changes uh, that really one make more sense for the owner to do and would and in uh, most cases um, take uh, will be faster um, and can be cost prohibitive the city. Um, I say that not to say that there aren't other ways, and um, you've been such a champion on very specific buildings and instances where there might be gaps, um, ways we can um, uh, um, make sure that the tools work best in tandem and, and finding ways to address gaps that might exist um, in the current system that we have. Hi, and um, I would just, again, Marie Santiago again. Um, I would just add that um, for those cases where you know tenants do are working with a community group, those community groups do are able to come to HPD and bring it to our attention, and we will look at the whole building, not just the one unit, um, and we will bring litigation as warranted, and we will do emergency repair as warranted. So even if it's just one tenant complaining, um, that tenant shouldn't feel like HPD isn't going to do everything um, possible to get those repairs done. Should an owner be negligent in responding? I guess what I'm really asking for is like, if there's a way to for all of us to work together on a proactive approach, um, you know, when a, a tenant call in and an inspector goes there, if there's a way to really connect that uh, tenant, you know, to a community organization or the local elected uh, officials office so that we can all work together to see if we can fix the whole building or organize the whole building and not just, you know, individual cases. Um, yes, those are important, but oftentimes if we can connect um, that one case and with mm -hmm. the whole building, um, then we can solve, you know, more problem quicker mm -hmm. and really help improve the condition in the whole building. So we definitely should look at a more proactive approach and how we can all work together. And we're certainly open to working with you, your, your staff on that, um, council member. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So I want to thank you so much for um, testifying today. I look forward to continuing to work with your office. It's been uh, uh, so far a tremendously rewarding experience, not only for myself and for the committee, but for the constituents of the city of New York. So thank you. Thank you. So we'll call up uh, DOB. And then we'll have uh, our public portion.
So now that all the members of the OB are here, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, and just for the record, in the interest of time, I'm going to waive my very lengthy and in-depth opening statement. And I suggest that where that can be done for others, we do the same. So I'm trying to lead by example. <laughs> so we'll just take this uh, opportunity to affirm your testimony. If you could just raise your right hands for me. 
Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I, I do. do. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. You can, you can begin, Mr. Uh, Commissioner Chandler. Good afternoon, Chair Carnegie and members of the Housing and Buildings Committee. I'm Rick Chandler, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Buildings, and I'm joined by First Deputy Commissioner Thomas Ferriello, Deputy Commissioner of Finance Administration, Sharon Neal, and other members of my senior staff. Before I discuss the Department's fiscal year 2019 preliminary budget and highlight the significant progress we've made in achieving our Building One City objectives, I'd like to take a moment to welcome the Chair and new members to the Committee. I'd also like to welcome back some familiar faces. I'm looking forward to working with all of you as we continue to modernize the Department to better serve and protect New Yorkers. The Department is the primary, is the primary regulator of an industry that is expected to spend $52 billion in 2018. Our role in supporting the city's economy cannot be overstated. By enforcing the construction codes, rules, and other regulations that govern nearly 1.1 million buildings and 45,000 active construction sites, we facilitate job creation, spur the development of affordable housing, and uphold high standards in energy efficiency, all while adhering to our principal mandate to promote the safety of everyone who lives, works, and builds in New York City. We are making significant progress on our plan for fundamental reform, building one city which includes numerous initiatives to enhance public and worksite safety, reduce wait times and delays, and modernize all aspects of the Department's operations. Through an unprecedented commitment of resources from the Mayor and the City Council and the hard work of our employees, we are working in lockstep with the Mayor's goals to increase affordable housing, support small businesses, advance a culture of public safety, and build a thriving, equitable, sustainable, and resilient city across the five boroughs. I'm pleased to be here to discuss the Department's preliminary budget, the preliminary budget allocates approximately $183 million in expense funds to the Department. Of this, approximately $149 million is for personal services, funding 1,870 budgeted employees, and $34 million is for the other than personal services. The preliminary budget provides funding of $18.5 million and 221 positions to support three initiatives, including construction site safety and training compliance, tenant protection, and basement apartment pilot program. The Department is a revenue-producing agency. The revenue forecast for the Department is approximately $298 million, which does not include an estimated $66 million in penalties collected resulting from Department-issued violations adjudicated before the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings. The Department has made significant progress in improving services to its customers, all while facing a scale of construction unparalleled in the City's history. In fiscal year 2017, the Department issued nearly 166,000 initial and renewal permits combined, a 3% increase from fiscal 2016 and a 12% increase from fiscal year 2015. Of those permits, 109,700 were initial building permits, including 2,100 new building permits and 107,000 alteration permits. The remaining 56,000 were renewals. It should also be noted that the Department issued 2,030 demolition permits last year which shows that construction activity throughout the city has shown little signs of abating. Despite the uptick in construction activity, I'm proud to report that our service levels continue to improve. Our plan review times have decreased significantly across the board since fiscal year 2015 to fiscal year 2017. The average time to complete a first plan review for new buildings and major alterations has decreased by more than nine days from 15 days, uh, from 15 days to six days. The average time to complete first plan reviews for new building applications filed through our hub, which allows for electronic filing of plans, decreased by 13 days from 18 days to 5 days. The average time to complete first plan reviews for major alteration applications also filed through the hub decreased from 16 days to 5 days. The Department is also responding to complaints expeditiously. We received 16,600 Priority A complaints in fiscal year 2017. A complaints capture violating conditions that, if occurring, present an immediate threat to the public and include unsafe demolitions, building instability, and improper egress. While our target to respond to these complaints is 24 hours, we respond within 14 hours of receipt and within two hours for the most serious cases. We received 73,000 Priority B complaints in fiscal year 2017. B complaints capture violating conditions that, if occurring, while serious, do not present an immediate threat to the public. These include complaints of excessive construction debris, cracked retaining walls, and tampering with posted notices. Our target to respond to these complaints is 40 days. 
These complaints, which were responded to in over 40 days just a few years ago, are as of last month now responded to within nine days. These tremendous gains are the result of the hard work and dedication of our inspectors and the use of data analytics to better target our resources. And DOB Now Inspections, which is a platform that provides online scheduling for virtually all inspections, make it e making it easier to schedule inspection appointments and improve inspection traffic tracking and notifications. One of the most important outcomes of the Mayor's increased investment in the Department is the increased capacity to analyze and use data. The Department has always collected data, but now we are able to marshal this information to improve operations and better inform the public about our work. In November 2017, we launched the New York City Construction Dashboard, which is a data-rich interactive quarterly report on construction and real estate development in every neighborhood of the city. In addition to the dashboard, our data analytics team is also providing the public with a series of topical subject area reports, the first of which is our citywide facade safety and sidewalk shed report. The Department is committed to promoting safe and compliant construction and improving quality of life for all New Yorkers. In 2018, the construction, in 2018, Construction Safety Week will be the week of May 7th, and the Department will be engaging in a number of initiatives to promote safe construction. This includes department staff visiting construction sites to promote uh, safety during our multilingual Experience is Not Enough campaign. The campaign emphasizes the importance of safety and is intended to remind workers that they must use proper fall protection, such as safety harnesses, guardrails, and netting, regardless of how much experience they possess. During Construction Safety Week, the Department will also be hosting its annual Build Safe, Live Safe conference on May 10th. Hundreds of construction professionals are expected to attend department-led seminars where they will learn about the latest accident trends and best practices for improving safety. There were 12 fatalities on building construction sites last year, a number that has remained constant over the past three years. Even one death is too many and any loss of life is unacceptable. Injuries have increased by nearly 40 percent from 472 in 2015 to 666 in 2017. There are several explanations for the increase in injuries, including increased construction activity and required safety professionals on more construction sites reporting accidents that have previously gone unreported. However, a lack of safety training for construction workers could also be a cause of accidents. Last year, 16 local laws were enacted focusing on the issue of construction safety. I would like to thank this committee for its partnership in advancing this important issue. Certainly the most impactful of these laws is Local Law 196, which when fully phased in, will require that workers at many job sites receive a minimum of 40 hours of safety training and that supervisors at job sites receive a minimum of 60 hours of safety training. The Department has been hard at work leading up to the first major milestone in the law, March 1st, when a minimum of 10 hours of safety training became mandatory for workers. Since the enactment of the law, the Department has been hosting biweekly information sessions for all facets of the construction industry. The Department has also been providing regular updates concerning the law's implementation through a number of different channels, reaching many thousands of stakeholders. In conjunction with the Mayor's Office and our partner agencies, including the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs and the Department of Small Business Services, a day of action was held last month where flyers and palm cards in multiple languages were distributed to workers throughout the city. There are also advertisements running, or soon to come, on Link NYC kiosks, bus stop shelters, social media, and on 311 to inform workers of the new training requirement. The Site Safety Training Task Force, which the law mandated, convened last month to, dis to discuss the training curriculum. Recommendations from the task force were submitted to me by March 1st in accordance with the law. I am currently reviewing the task force for recommendations and expect to issue a determination on the training curriculum, including the content and number of hours of required training in short order. As soon as the curriculum is finalized, it will be shared broadly so course providers can submit their curriculum to us for approval. And the important work of providing safety training for workers can continue. Also worth highlighting are a number of laws that will improve crane safety. Among these are laws that will require that anemometers capable of measuring wind speed be installed on cranes. Hoisting machine operators of large cranes obtain a license rating to operate such cranes and require that certain cranes be retired on once they have reached a certain age. The Department also sends out regular weather advisories to inform property owners, contractors, and crane operators to take appropriate precautionary measures during inclement weather. Together, these laws and practices will help ensure that crane operations in the city are safe. 
The department received and responded to nearly 90,000 complaints from the public in fiscal year 2017, and together with the 156,000 development inspections completed in that time frame, the department issued approximately 66,000 ECB violations, an increase of almost 27 percent from fiscal year 2015 when the department issued approximately 52,000 ECB violations. Behind these numbers is our commitment to all New Yorkers that we will vigorously discipline bad actors in the construction industry. Our enhanced enforce, uh, information technology and data analytics capabilities have improved our ability to target resources where the greatest risk exists and to identify bad actors. In February, the Department issued its first monthly enforcement action report. This report, which has been well received, <coughs> details the Department's actions to sanction and deter bad actors in the construction industry through the enforcement of safety laws and codes of conduct for construction professionals. In the March 2018 Enforcement Action Report, the following actions are highlighted. $127,000 in fines, including daily penalties, were issued for illegal building alterations at eight different locations. $90,000 in fines, including daily penalties, were issued for illegal transient use of buildings at 10 different locations. $140,000 in fines for failure to safeguard constructions at 14 different locations. And $50,000 in fines were issued to five different individuals for failure to carry out duties as construction superintendents. Keep in mind that these are just the highlights of adjudicated actions and do not include the thousands of violations we issue routinely each month. The Department has also been quite active issuing more licenses to construction professionals representing the 25 trades we license or register. <coughs> the Department issued 3,100 licenses in 2016 and 4,300 licenses in 2017. The increases can be attributed in part to an increase in construction superintendent and journeyman plumber licenses. We expect this number to continue to grow as we add three license types over 2018 and 2019, including lift director, limited gas use, and journeyman gas use. In an effort to improve the city's collection of penalties associated with the violations, the department is requiring that all applicants for a license pay any outstanding penalties before it being issued a license. This effort has resulted in the collection of $3.7 million over the last two years. We are also regularly taking action to suspend or revoke the licenses, registrations, or filing privileges of professionals who work on safely and put their lives and the lives of others at risk. In 2017, the Department took disciplinary action against 77 licensees, including revoking or suspending the licenses of 19 individuals or corporations, and 22 design professionals either surrendered filing privileges or had them revoked. Notable disciplinary actions taken against licensees and design professionals last year include Fazal, Fazal Hassan, a general contractor and registered construction superintendent, surrendered both registrations after three workers were injured when a roof collapsed on them at 3125 28th Road in Long Island City. Alphonse Prestia, a co registered construction superintendent, surrendered his registration after he was convicted of manslaughter for his role in the death of a worker at a construction site located at 9th Avenue in Manhattan. Robert. Lenahan, a registered architect, had his Directive 14 and professional certification privileges revoked for knowingly including false statements on multiple technical reports submitted to the Department. Daniel Odigi, a professional engineer, surrendered all Directive 14 and professional certification privileges for submitting multiple defective sidewalk shed applications to the Department, including for a sidewalk shed that collapsed on November 19, 2017 in Manhattan. Tenant protection continues to be a focus of the Department. The Department participates in the City's Tenant Harassment Prevention Task Force, a partnership between multiple city and state agencies in which cellar to roof inspections are performed, investigations identify bad actors, and the appropriate enforcement actions are taken. Separately, the Department also partners with the Department of Housing Preservation and Development in performing inspections. Over the past two years, the task force has conducted over 1,800 inspections, resulting in the issuance of 1,300 violations. 47 partial or full stop work orders and 30 partial or full vacate orders. Resulting from our investigation, several owners have been referred to the State Attorney General's Office and are in various stages of prosecution and settlement negotiations. Notably, in September 2017, the Attorney General, the Governor, and the Mayor announced a first-of-its-kind settlement between the Task Force and ICON Realty Management. The settlement requires ICON to adopt policies and procedures to prevent future violations and safety risks correct all outstanding violations, establish safe construction practices, provide rent abatements to tenants during disruption of essential services, appoint a tenant liaison to immediately address tenant concerns, and establish an independent monitor ensure ICON's compliance with this agreement. 
The settlement also requires ICON to pay $300,000 to the State of New York on behalf of the task force and over $200,000 in penalties, fees, and costs to the City. Twelve local laws that seek to address the use of construction to harass tenants were enacted last year. The Department is hard at work implementing these laws. When fully implemented, these laws will require, among other things, that tenant protection plans include detailed information regarding the measures, to, the measures in place to protect tenants and that the Department inspect 5 percent of occupied buildings undergoing construction. Greater scrutiny of contractors who have been found to conduct work without a required permit and increases in civil penalties for work without a permit and for violating a stop work order. The Department received $5.2 million in funding to strengthen its ability to protect tenants from construction harassment. The additional 75 positions providing, provided relating to tenant protection legislation include inspectorial, administrative, and technical staff. We recently received approval for this funding and are actively advertising and recruiting to fill these lines. I'd now like to turn your attention to the Department's work in connection with the development process. There's been substantial improvements in wait times for development inspections despite increases in the number of inspection requests. In fiscal year 2017, the Department conducted 156,000 development inspections, up over 12 percent from 139,000 inspections in fiscal year 2015. The average wait time for a development inspection since fiscal year 2015 fell by a day from four days to three days. The Department has deployed a number of strategies to further improve upon these plan review service levels, including increasing its plan examiner workforce. The Department also created a supervisory position, assistant chief plan examiner, to monitor productivity and the quality of plan reviews. In addition to hiring more examiners, the Department published on its website project guidelines. A common refrain from the industry has been that the plan exam process was too unpredictable, varying widely from borough to borough and project to project. In order to ensure our customers receive consistent answers, the Department developed and is publishing a series of plan exam guidelines for a wide variety of projects. These guidelines, which with specific versions for property owners and design professionals, detail the items that must be provided when submitting construction documents and filing for permits. We also use these same guidelines to train our staff, helping to ensure predictable and consistent reviews. The Department has also hired more project advocates to assist customers in navigating the process the project planning and construction processes free of charge. The multi-year replacement of this Department's core information system is progressing as we continue to shift add additional filing types off the mainframe system that the Department has relied on for over 30 years to a new browser-based system called DOB Now. Upon completion, customers will be able to perform virtually all interactions with the Department online and the system will also result in increased transparency both externally and internally. In the second half of 2017, we added a number of permit types to DOB Now build, including antenna, curb cut, fence, elevator, scaffold, sidewalk shed, sign, and electrical, with which over 60,000 annual applications is the largest of the 33 different types of build permits that the Department issues. In the DOB Now safety module, we added filings of annual boiler inspections. At the beginning of this year, we added the ability in DOB Now inspections for applicants to request certificate of occupancy sign-offs for electrical and plumbing work on new building and major alterations. This new functionality has, in just a few weeks, already served over 400 applicants from having to visit a borough office to make this request in person, and the checks were embedded in the online system have also add the added effect of reducing the number of incorrect submissions, thereby also improving the Department's response time to these requests. By the end of this year, we expect to complete the second of three phases in the rollout of DOB Now. At that point, nearly two-thirds of the transactions that the Department processes, applications, filings, inspections, licenses, and permit issuances will all be going through DOB Now. This summer, we will be adding elevator compliance filings, which consist of more than 100,000 annual inspections and tests. Later on, we will add permits for general construction, mechanical, and structural, as well as limited alteration applications. We'll also be beginning the rollout of licensing, which is the last of our four modules of DOB Now, and which upon completion will handle the issuance and renewal of more than two dozen different license types that the Department currently administers. Concerning our construction codes, the Department is not only embarking on its periodic revision, which will involve the hard work of over 500 industry and agency participants, we are also moving forward with, the creating, with creating two entirely new codes. The construction codes, which include building, plumbing, mechanical, fuel, gas, and electrical codes, are periodically updated to ensure they incorporate the latest technologies and national standards, along with local modifications to fit the city's dense urban environment. 
Following the mayor's direction to simplify the codes to make compliance easier, the department has also kicked off a research effort with the goal of developing recommendations for a code to specifically address work on existing buildings. Currently, when performing construction in an existing building, one or all of a myriad of local and state codes need to be adhered to. An existing building code will improve ease of use by consolidating all of the requirements in one place. To address the need for regulation on waterfront properties, the department is undertaking an effort to develop code requirements for waterfront structures. While current construction code and national code requirements address building construction generally, current regulations do not specifically address design and construction requirements for waterfront structures such as piers, wharves, and seawalls, which can serve as the foundation for new building construction on water. While we are proud of our progress thus far, there is more work to, still to be done. We thank the Council for its support and look forward to continuing our work together to improve the Department for the benefit of all New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, for your testimony. Um, I regret to inform you that this hearing will be moved uh, to the 16th floor at 250 Broadway immediately. We have been supplanted by a larger, more in-depth hearing. Um, anyone who has signed up to testify is welcome to join me across the street at 250 Broadway. Um, the, the, the queue still remains the same. If you signed up to testify, I have your slip and you'll be allowed to testify. Uh, we'll be reconvening in seven minutes. <laughs> across the street, so that means if you would indulge me by hustling up a little bit uh, to the 16th floor so that we can continue this hearing. Thank you so much. I'm sorry for the inconvenience. I'm sorry. So this is just for the continuation of the Department of Buildings hearing. If you're here for NYCHA, please remain in this room. All participants in the Department of Buildings hearing, which is a continuation, uh, please. Thank you. I think, Patrick, you have to uh, identify yourself for the record. Apologies. My name is Patrick Whaley. I'm Assistant Commissioner for External Affairs at Buildings. Thank you. Uh, last year, my colleague and I, we passed several pieces of legislation as, pa as part of the Stand for uh, Tenant Safety Campaign uh, to provide, to improve the Department of Buildings oversight over various part of the building process. And one of my legislation is uh, Local Law 149, which require uh, DOB to audit 25% of applicants that self-certify uh, their work. So does DOB have enough staff to complete these audits in a, a timely manner? And have you, uh, what is your, your plan in terms of uh, getting that started? So to answer your question briefly, yes, we do have the staffing to perform those audits. Um, the entire package of tenant protection legislation, um, of which there are a number, um, we're in substantial compliance with all of them, including this one. So currently right now, um, if there is a landlord um, who has been found guilty of harassing tenants, um, any filings that come out of that building cannot be professionally certified. Um, so we have made substantial progress on, on this local law in addition to others as well. Okay. Uh, and my last question, Chair, is that I know that in your testimony, um, Commissioner, you talk about um, the violation that you issue, and some of them are oath, um, that you have to, the, the, the violator have to go to oath. In my district, I have all these oversized retail, um, all these uh, stores that uh, have large uh, space that did not comply with the regulation in Soho, and I'm, I've, uh, thank you know, the Department of Building for issuing violation uh, to these uh, businesses. And my question is that, are we collecting uh, the fines? Uh, because I've heard from some constituents that there are times where at the hearing, they don't see uh, staff from DOB there. And then the case can get dismissed or uh, adjourned. Uh, and I really appreciate uh, Department of Building, you know, making that effort because we got to kind of stop this uh, oversized retail, but we don't want the, them to get away with not paying fine and think it's, oh, just a court of doing business. I understand and I appreciate your vigilance on this issue. It's a complex issue, the one that's been around for a long time. I'm disappointed to hear others say that we might not have been at the hearings. Um, I, this is the first I'm hearing of it, but we'll definitely follow up on that. I would say that we track that regularly and I'll be able to find out how we're doing on that enforcement. If we're not, believe me, we will be back and we'll ask for another hearing. 
Um, but uh, as, as we've discussed in the past, it's a, it's a complex uh, zoning issue, and we have issued violations to those that we think are egregiously violating the issue. But I think uh, in we need to partner again with our partners at city planning to, to, uh, to refine the words in the zoning resolution because it's a very difficult thing to apply uh, the limitations as they're worded now to the, the different types of uses that fall within that limitation of 10,000 square feet. And without getting too far into the weeds, it's kind of hard to go into right now. But I'm happy to discuss it further. Yes, uh, and I appreciate yeah, your, your effort and your staff's uh, support on this. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member. Um, before I go to uh, Council Member Joni, um, I know that he has follow-up questions on just a very basic question. Uh, city funds are added to fiscal 2018 and fiscal 2019 to DOB's budget to support a basement apartment pilot program in East New York, which will subsidize basement conversions to assist building owners with bringing existing underground apartment units up to code. How will the DOB support this program? Like, so some people are confused between HPD and DOB, what the roles are. What is the specific role in the basement apartment program as it's assigned uh, to DOB? Thank you for that question. Uh, like a lot of things, we do work closely with HPD, and uh, we've shared with them, our, and I saw some of the questions that were asked of uh, Commissioner Tori Springer. Um, we absolutely talk about where we think our roles fit into applying this pilot program. So we've spent a lot of time talking to our partner agencies actually for months before we've gotten to this point. But what we're going to do is, as a DOB is uh, draft the, the uh, pilot legislation that establishes how we can uh, take action uh, legislatively and uh, from a regulatory perspective uh, how to get this pilot off the ground. We'll also obviously be reviewing all the applications and issuing the permits for, for that work and then also following up with construction inspections and finally issuing certificates of occupancy where needed. But we're coordinating regularly with HPD, fire department, health department, DEP, city planning, uh, the law department, and others, frankly. It's, uh, it's rather complex, but we are ready to move forward. So n not to get too much in the weeds, though, would, would DOB re be responsible for uh, making an assessment on a property to see if it met the, cons the, the criteria for being accepted into the program? No, that, that is not a DOB role. Uh, I think HPD is going to do that. And Patrick, do you want to comment? Or? Yeah, I think it's, so again, it's very much a collaborative effort. But ultimately, once we have legislation in place, um, applications are going to be submitted to the city, and the buildings department, through its regulatory authority, is going to have the responsibility of reviewing those applica applications to ensuring compliance with the code and zoning and, and issuing permits for work to commence. Right. So, so I know that uh, uh, the Commissioner Torres Springer stated that part of HPD's role would be to identify potential uh, individuals and then I thought the next role would be for DOB to, to, to make the assessment, like to go in and see if it met the criteria, two means of egress, those types of things. That seems like a buildings department, Understood. right? From, from a, you know, a novice perspective, it seems like that's what the, bu the building department would do to assess the safe site safety um, and, and those types of criteria. Sure. Uh my name is Thomas Fariolo. I'm the first deputy commissioner of the Department of Buildings. And so I think you're spot on. That's what we're going to be doing. But the owner would be hiring an architect or an engineer that would present the plans to us that would then have to comply with all the requirements that are going to be in this legislation that's going to be put forth. So I know that my colleague and some of my other colleagues have uh, stated that while it's a program that could be beneficial, it seems as though that process may be quite onerous on a homeowner who may be not uh, accustomed to being a landlord, uh, right? Because it was a basement apartment or basement unit that now can be converted, they, they may not be in the business of that. And it seems as though it could be onerous. And obviously we don't want to set uh, potential affordable housing uh, contributors up for failure uh, by having onerous fines, fees, and things associated, or even the, the mention of an architect, you know, shins shivers up my spine as a homeowner, because any time I've had to deal with an architect, it's, it's been onerous from a, a fiduciary standpoint. Um, and, and I'm just going to let my colleague, who has a slew of questions in regards to that. I can take uh, an attempt, Chair. Uh, uh, 
obviously we'll continue to work with our colleagues about the, the best outreach, but there, there is an outreach mechanism in place. Um, we're not playing a primary role in that, but we absolutely are available to have preliminary discussions with the homeowners and the outreach professionals from the city that are trying to uh, garner interest from the folks who to participate because it's in the city's interest to get people to participate and then to make it as easy as possible. So we have mechanisms in our offices and since this is East New York, our Brooklyn office will be very much prepared to have preliminary discussions, to have preliminary work before, uh, before professionals are fully engaged. Now, that said, we, we are regulators, we're not designers, uh, so we will provide advice up to the point where we would say, we think you can go ahead with this, now go ahead and engage your architect or engineer, and we'll be here ready for you when you file. But what we do on a regular basis uh, through, our, through Patrick's people in the various borough offices and, our, and Tom's people, our technical folks, we meet with people on, uh, before they get involved heavily in projects to try to do just what you said, to try to address their concerns about getting too deep before they know whether they're going to be able to be successful or not. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Jonah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Commissioner, thank you for that explanation. And I'll just piggyback on the issue of the legalizing of these apartments. I think we understand the importance. I think we uh, first should highlight that many of these homeowners that have been renting out these basement apartments uh, unknowingly that they are illegal. Uh, I believe in the 60s and 70s, all private homes were visited, and if there was a full kitchen and a half a bathroom, that property was assessed at a higher ratio. So it went from one family to a two family. So three times, four times a year when they pay their real estate taxes, they see two family home not knowing that their CLOs are one family. So for decades, the Department of Taxation and Finance has been benefiting from these properties at a higher tax rate classification, one, two. Obviously, the intent is to make sure that the don't allow for dangerous conditions, the safety of those occupants. So if there's no second means of egress or carbon monoxide issues, things of that nature that are, I guess, the priority. And then also adding on additional units to our housing market, which would help offset some of the demand by increasing the supply. If we look at this from a practical point, zoning consideration, parking requirements, uh, bringing the properties up to code with even sprinkler requirements makes, on top of the architect engineer, the construction work that would be needed, makes this almost impossible, even if the home qualifies uh, with current zoning, parking, Minimum requirements. It sounds like you were at some of our meetings earlier, I think, talking about some of the complexities here. Yes, uh, and that's why this is a pilot, because all of these things uh, have been addressed in some form to proceed with the pilot, and we are going to observe closely and try to learn what are the pertinent issues that needs to be need to be overcome, and then try to set us up, set the city up to assist these owners as they move forward. But again, uh, we, I, I commend the, the mayor and the administration for moving forward with this pilot because it has the potential to have a great outcome and so we are ready to, to evaluate that pilot along with our partner agencies and see wh where, it t where it brings us. Right, but I agree, but at the cost of $18.6 million, uh, knowing the hurdles and the obstacles from the very beginning, that if this is going to be a CFO change versus a license or permit putting the onerous responsibility on the homeowner now for the conversion, if they can even possibly do it without sidestepping zoning requirements and codes, uh, and the expense would make sense. Now they would be subject to a rent-stabilized tenant, which they're not prepared for, or have no um, working experience in that sector. Putting this all together, this is a very difficult and challenging approach. So unless we're going to waive some of these requirements from the onset, and we know what they are, um, to legalize these apartments, why begin something that will yield in a net zero gain? 
So, Council Member, all the concerns you're raising are very valid concerns, and as the Commissioner mentioned, these are the very types of things that we've been discussing. Just bear in mind that we're going through a pilot program right now, and we're in the process of creating that pilot through drafting legislation. Once that pilot is put in place, then we'll be doing the hard work of evalu evaluating how that pilot works out. So all your concerns are very much well-founded. We're certainly well aware of them, but we're moving forward with, with the potential of, of perhaps unleashing a large stock of new affordable housing. Certainly we all think it's something worth pursuing. We're very much aware of the concerns that you've raised, and as part of this process, again, of drafting a pilot, evaluating that pilot, these are the very kinds of things that we need to be uh, very thoughtful of. And just so I'm correct in my numbers, I believe the average architectural cost is about 15000 If they had to do a sprinkler upgrade, you're looking anywhere up to 25000 depending on the number of units. Does those two fees of 40000 to legalize a basement apartment is going to be a difficult hurdle? I think costs, costs vary based on the project, mm -hmm. but there is a cost associated with doing this. And once again, we need to evaluate that work. Can you elaborate a little bit on the Build It Back program? Uh, how many more properties are out there that have not been restored and are on the waiting list, the dollar amounts, the budget for the Build It Back program? Um, and I don't mean the uh, PS, but uh, what's left in the fund to help restore these homes and where we are? Hi, good afternoon. I'm Sharon Neal. I'm the Deputy Commissioner for Finance and Admin. So right now there were 5,100 uh, 5, um, jobs filed and they're pretty much in the process of um, either in process or completed and we're estimating that another 200 jobs are to be filled. The current to be filed, currently the budget is providing about 40 positions to continue that work. In terms of any additional, um, you know, um, funding to support the program outside of what's in our budget, um, HRO would probably have more information on but that. You said there, f there were 5,000 applications, correct? How many of them been restored and closed out and fully funded and? Uh, I think we'd have to give you those numbers. I don't, I don't, I mean, I have them, but I don't have them with me. This is really important. Sure. We've got so many people that are still waiting for their approvals. Of the 5,000 that were approved, how many were applications were denied? So you're saying denied by DOB or denied by HR? Well, denied by the Build It Back program in itself. So whether it be DOB or by whatever mechanism or agency or authority, uh, applications were made uh, due to damages during Hurricane Sandy, which was more than six years ago, and they were never approved for reimbursement, for funding. Do we have those numbers? Those numbers wouldn't be provided by us. That's yeah, that's that would be HRO that would provide those numbers. We yeah. know of the numbers of people who are in the program, who've been accepted into the program, and who have filed applications with the department. We can give you those numbers. That number is? I think it's 5,100 total mm -hmm. that are in various stages. I could break it down. That have been filed with us. I mean, this you, the question earlier was what's our role with the, the, uh, the basement pilot. It, there's comparisons to the to the Build It Back in that our role is to uh, do the technical administration and regulation for the project, but there's a lot bigger uh, umbrella uh, project on, ongoing. So HRO is the one who processes the applications for reimbursement and then allows people to get into the program. And I, there's a lot of complex uh, uh, variables in that, in that activity, but once it gets into the system and there are architects and engineers that file with us, who have been contracted by the HRO program to do it, uh, they get through our system very quickly. So uh, the moment we hear about somebody being delayed, uh, we, we are all over it. So I don't uh, agree with the, the comments about people being held up with, with the Department of Buildings related issues on their build it back issues. Oftentimes there's other factors involved. But we stand at the ready to, to go out today or tomorrow at any time anybody wants us out. I look forward to working on that with Absolutely. the commissioner. There's Absolutely. a lot to six years later uh, where we have families that haven't been able to move back into their homes right. and are living in terrible conditions uh, is alarming and disappointing. But thank you. Let me just continue. Construction site safety. Please explain this to me. Last week I chaired the SBS uh, hearings on uh, the budget. This was already proposed in there. And it was at a $18.7 million investment <coughs> for fiscal 
19 through 21 at 5 point three and 5.3 in the year 2022. Please explain to me how is it that we are working on construction site training from two various agencies for the same purposes when we currently have much opposition from industry, in particular the uh, labor forces where they're opposing taxpayer funds to non-government entities for construction safety training when they currently offer the same training, are paying for it, or their members are paying for it, and it looks like a bit redundancy and concerning because these are big dollar amounts and if we've been entrusted to make sure that taxpayer dollars are spent wisely, your number of, is it 13.2 uh, million for 42 positions? Let me speak to that. There, there is a distinction between what you're seeing within SBS's budget and what you're seeing within the Buildings Department's budget. The Buildings Department budget, as it relates to construction safety, relates to performing inspections by and large, inspecting to ensure that workers on these sites have the appropriate amount of training, okay? Whereas the SBS side of the equation relates to actual training itself. The Buildings Department is not charged with training these workers. The Buildings Department is charged with enforcing the law and performing inspections to ensure that workers on these sites have the appropriate amount of training. That's the distinction between one and the other. The law also provides that the city will provide training to those individuals who have limited access to training. And I presume the money that you're seeing in SBS's budget, the total dollar amount and lines I'm not familiar with, relates to that piece of construction safety, the actual training of those workers who have limited access to training. We'll continue that as well. D it just sounds like a very complicated uh, approach to something that's very simplistic in nature, um, in that there are already entities in place that have been doing this for a long, long time, and not only I'm referring to the training and the enforcement end of it, um, which I believe can be streamlined and made more efficient, but very complicated. Well, I, I agree with you, it's a very complicated issue. Uh, and it's something that uh, we're doing uh, something new that this agency hasn't done before. So uh, we will get it, we'll get there. It's just a little bit of a learning process for us as well as everybody else. It was also brought to my attention, I think you touched on it in your uh, introduction, waterfront permitting. I believe there is a move to remove the waterfront permitting responsibilities from SPS and streamline it into DOB where it should have been from the very onset. Well, I th uh, it's, I'm not going to speak to where it should have been from the onset, but uh, that's certainly been an, a frequent question of my predecessor, to my predecessors and to me from the day that I started. And I think that the appropriate way to proceed is to um, evaluate the best way to file applications and what kind of code applies. It would be very, very simple to just transfer a couple of people and ask them to start taking applications for the waterfront. but. Um, we're in the process of changing our agency and we want the waterfront applications to, to mimic everything else we do, which is being the bars being set very high. So that's why we are in the process of having consultants help us create a waterfront code. And then we will incorporate it into our DOB Now platform so that everything is done online. I encourage that. And Thank you. I appreciate your support. Sooner and later. Um, and those are, these are softballs I threw at you so far. Uh, so let me get into some of the more difficult questions and I hope that you can help me get a better understanding. Um, there's been many complaints uh, and has been brought to my attention concerns about plan examiners um, with very little oversight and training and just so we have an I have a better understanding architects submit plans they go through some type of review with plan examiners there's an approval developer goes out constructs comes back to find out that the building or the construction is not in compliance and then has to correct it. And in some cases, it's almost impossible to correct. How can it possibly be that a developer using an architect getting approved plans by a plan examiner, by the DOB, finds himself erecting a structure which is illegal and non-compliant? 
Well, I think uh, you heard me in my testimony that we issued nearly 166,000 permits last year after, after review. Uh, and sometimes that review is quite limited. And what we've asked to the, the architect and engineering community to do is to s professionally certify jobs that they feel confident in submitting to us uh, as long as we have a robust audit program with that. And uh, this, our uh, team here and this body here have discussed the professional certification and what we've been doing for some time. Uh, we think that our audit program is, is robust. Uh, and what happens if, if an architect or engineer submits something that there's a problem with afterward, then we will raise that as an issue. We try to do it as expeditiously as possible. With that said, uh, I can't guarantee that there hasn't been a job where it's already started building where we've made an issue of it before they've gotten too far along. I, I was brought to my attention that it wasn't a self-certification. It was submitted for review and approval to find out that after approval and after construction, only when there was an application made for a CFO to find out that the building did not comply. So I'm happy to take that address and we'll look into it. Uh, that would certainly be a very rare occurrence if that happened. But possible, but, but and I'm sure it's happened in your... You know why? Because we have uh, human beings that are sitting looking at these plans. And so who's sometimes public we deal with human beings so that make mistakes. Where would the responsibility be? Who would be ultimately responsible? Always always with the owner, always. How, but the owner and their architect and engineer. Help me understand this, please. Okay. Owner, developer, yeah. ma decides to make a serious investment, follows by hiring a licensed architect who I believe is entrusted to do the right thing, uh, goes to the appropriate agency for the correct approval, gets approval, and if it's human error, after the approvals have been done and the construction has been complete, only at the time of C of O application, and he's responsible after following every step of the way? Uh, Absolutely, and a perfect example is uh, your council, uh, your colleague, Council Member Chin, who uh, we would say that um, the built the business owners for in uh, Soho, they would argue very vehemently that they are f in full compliance whether we have come to them and issued these violations. So one perfect example would be the violations that we spoke to Council Member Chin moments ago because those folks that we issued violations to are going to argue that we're wrong in, in saying that uh, they're in violation. So th it's, not, uh, it's not uncommon for owners to believe that uh, when we're enforcing something after the fact that we're wrong, there's, there's arguments on both sides whether we're wrong or not. And if we found that we've, wrong, we've, we've made a mistake in our plan review, then we'll absolutely be vigorous about trying to make the least impactful correction with that. And if I, and if I could just add, architects and engineers are licensed by the state of New York. They're submitting applications to the buildings department with a sign and seal attesting that what they've submitted to this department complies with code and zoning. So they certainly bear responsibility if there are any errors. Furthermore, you know, we'd be curious to, to hear the example it sounds like you're citing so we can look at, look at it and get back to you. But to the extent there is an issue like you're explaining, it is the absolute exception. Again, the commissioner mentioned, you know, 160,000 permits that we issued, probably well over 100,000 plans submitted. The scale of work that this, res this department is responsible for is enormous. I and we're human beings, and there might be instances very, very rare where, an, where, where um, something slips. But, you know, we should all be sure that ultimately architects and engineers who are licensed by the state have an obligation to file uh, documents with the department that comply with code and zoning. First of all, the amount of work and the undertaking is tremendous for the Department of Buildings. It's undeniable. Um, and I agree with you that a licensed architect or engineer has a responsibility here. But the process and the checks and balances to make sure that they're doing th their work properly is this agency which approves their work. So there should be a responsibility on the approving agency <laughs> for human error. Otherwise, we wouldn't need permits. We'd allow it. We'd give it to the architect or engineer to draw up, classify, and say you can build as a right without having the approval process from building department. But there is a need for checks and balance. And there should be a responsibility on plan examiners, I would imagine, uh, and not 
place it just on the architects and engineers. Understood, and I, I would say that, that those checks and balances are in fact in place given the overwhelming majority of applications that we approve, permits that are issued for work that is absolutely in compliance with code and zoning. Mm -hmm. ADA compliance, thank you for that. Wait a minute, uh, council member, I'll just give one more question. I'd really like to be able to today hear from the public. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we don't get to do that because the day gets too long. So if you, if you would. Then what I'll do is I'll just mention some points uh, on the record and maybe if you can answer them quickly, um, considering the time constraint that we're under. I understand there's an issue with adult senior daycares in commercial zones versus residential zones um, where children's daycare do not have the same interpretation. Um, secondly, ADA compliance in landmark areas where landmarks does not approve permanent ADA ramps subject in the properties to violation for not having permanent but offering temporary ramp service. And thirdly, and I hope you can explain a little bit on this one, uh, for actually there's a, a follow-up to this. There's a determination request that's made of building codes and zoning. For any building other than one, two, and three family homes, there's a fee of $1,000 for the first request. If, there's a den if it's denied, then they must uh, go to Manhattan, I believe, at an additional cost of $2,500 for a determination classification. This seems like a tremendous amount of money that has to be paid for something that I would imagine our um, department buildings would be easy to respond to, to make sure that we don't have human error on architects or engineers where the developer is ultimately held responsible to hold the bag of correction if there needs be. And the last part of this, and the citywide savings, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, I believe store signage. The codes, the laws were implemented back in 1961 without any further updating. Since then, there was a moratorium because very few of our signage is compliant, and I believe the law says no more than 12 square feet of signage, printable signage, is permitted. One of the issues that you bring up is that you're looking to increase on citywide saving program will be the dollar amount of revenue will be an increased collection of revenue from fees related to illuminated signs, which I understand are a problem to begin with and illegal. So explain this to me. We issue permits for a sign that's illegal, that doesn't comply with the laws, to find out that later on there'll be a penalty that starts at five thousand dollars. Sorry, that's a and it's a very loaded hot potato. So there's a, there's a lot there, obviously. Mm. What I'd like to do, in the interest of time, I can touch on a couple of those things, but we haven't had the opportunity to actually sit down with you, and we can do that in real short order and get into the meat and potatoes of all these questions that you're raising. You know, in terms of going backwards, in terms of the signage issue, we're issuing permits for the sign structure, not for the actual sign, and that's an important distinction. They get a permit to put a sign structure up. Subsequent to that, they get a permit to put a sign up, and that's where there might be a problem. So yeah, I that, would say so. That's, that's the <laughs> distinction, and it's an important distinction. You can put a sign structure up in a certain area, but then putting, depending on the size of the sign on the structure, that's where there might be issues with code and zoning. And the last source of revenue is going to be um, develop a request to reinspect hazardous areas. So I would imagine we want to make this as painless as possible, where there's very little hurdles to overcome to have hazardous, to have, to reinspect hazardous conditions. By placing additional fees on this would allow or deter reinspection of hazardous areas and conditions. I'm just trying to clarify that we should be looking in the best interest of the people, citizens, developers, uh, and all the stakeholders, of course, that the more hurdles that we place and requirements that we place that we don't even hold ourselves accountable to creates a challenging environment to build and develop, um, and I'm just concerned. But I'm mm -hmm. looking forward to 
Understood, yeah. Council Member. We hear your concerns loud and clear, and we look forward to sitting down with you in short order to go through all these issues and more. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, just because we're moving along and in the, in the interest of time, I do agree with my colleague about uh, a lot of the onerous uh, situations that homeowners find themselves in. So certainly we will circle back and over the course of this next four years, hopefully begin to reduce or even look at it in a, in a good common sense way, uh, how we can be more supportive. So thank you, Council Member. Thank you for your patience. Mm -hmm. Council Member Rosenthal. Thanks so much, uh, and com uh, Chair Carnegie and Commissioner. It's great to see you. Thanks you for coming over. You know, I'm going to ask you, as you know, about the Office of the Tenant Advocate, and uh, you're shocked. I know, shocker. Um, but I want you to know that I, I was thinking about the question I would ask sitting here, and I realized that Patrick is the Office of the Tenant Advocate for me, and I do appreciate him, and I mean that in all sincerity. I mean, I call him. He sends out inspectors, and um, we get some results. So I do appreciate that. Um, currently, in the preliminary budget, are there lines for a true office of the tenant advocate? I think in the um, fiscal responsibility that was attached to the original bill, there were two lines. Is that part of the 75? So at this time, no funding has been provided for the Office of the Tenant Advocate. No, I'm asking, oh, in the preliminary budget, no. none. And do you expect it to be funded in the executive budget? It's not. Are clear. you asking the mayor for funding for the Office of the Tenant Advocate? So currently, the way the functions of tenant advocacy are handled, they're typically cross-departmental. So at this time, we're dealing with the, the issues by having the contact information on our website. The Office of the Building Marshal is the primary contact that-, that So you're missing my question. I only have a second, and I'm not gonna play, okay? We need an office, the bill asked for an office of the tenant advocate, and it required in the fiscal statement two FTEs. I'm asking you if the Department of Buildings asked for two FTEs for the executive budget, yes or no? No. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let me give you two examples of why we need an Office of the Tenant Advocate, some people who would actually be actively advocating about tenants, would be able to see patterns, would be able to do the patterns of harassment, would be able to do the work of reviewing the tenant protection plan in a meaningful way, would be able to implement all the laws that this mayor signed this past summer, right? So I'm, I've pulled up two recently. Uh, this one just yesterday. Commissioner, you might remember, I, I forget if it was in my first or second year, I spoke to you at a, about a building where, um, I'm really not gonna say the name of the owner out loud, but it was somebody who you knew and um, the way that harassment manifested itself at that building, this is a penthouse rent regulated building. I'm sure the developer would love nothing more than to sell it or rent it out for squillions. But no, there's a rent regulated tenant who lives there and has rights. And um, last year I spoke to you about the fact that the building owner repeatedly took out work permits um, to fix s uh, some facade work uh, right outside this gentleman's window. Uh, there had been several permits pulled. The jackhammering continued for a number of years. Um, now the latest complaint is that uh, literally the complaint says um, my neighbor, this guy who's being harassed, sorry, his neighbor is saying my neighbor, um, ha has a new illegal structure above his kitchen posing extreme fire safety concerns for the entire building. Last summer, the complaint, and I don't think I mentioned this to you, was that there was an illegal manufacturing business being operated 
in this apartment. This is a 15 foot by 15 foot studio apartment. So just to be clear, this unit has not changed. It was rented in 1975 and no structural work has be been done. If there was an office of a tenant advocate, somebody would be there noticing this pattern and practice of harassment and, you know, perhaps would be working with HPD or using other tools to make it clear to the owner of the building that they needed to stop doing that. But we don't have that right now. The second example is of a building where um, there was a fire uh, in the building. Half the units were rent regulated, half market. And the, um, the fire destroyed all the apartments. Everyone was out. It's now a year and a half later. Remarkably, the market units have been brought back and are ready to rent out. But the rent regulated ones, of course, you couldn't enter. There's been no work to fix them. And previously, DOB did the right thing in issuing a vacate order, but no one is paying attention to the fact that this building owner has plenty of money to refurbish for the market rate, but not for the rent regulated. I mean, I have a story like this every week. And as excellent as your building marshals are, and Patrick, and you, and you, and Tim, everyone, the intent of the law is not being carried out by the Department of Buildings. And um, I, I just, we passed a law requiring two people and an office of the tenant advocate, and I don't understand your answer. Um, we'll revisit as to what it is that we're requesting, uh, but that doesn't change that we have been doing tenant advocacy and tenant harassment work long before the law was passed uh, successfully, in my opinion, and we are doing it now. So we can call it, uh, we can call it tenant advocate. It will be within our, our uh, building marshal's office, and we'll, and I recall your example of the building on the Upper West Side, I believe, and um, We'll you spoke to him at a gala, I think, that night. The owner? Yeah. I think it would be possibly. Um, and so I'm happy to follow up again because uh, it bothers me. But you see, me. it doesn't end. No, and it so doesn't. So the, that's we can talk why I agree member. that you're, you're doing some work and there are some people there. The nature of this problem is overwhelming. And most of the violations issued on tenant harassment cases come from the Department of Buildings. And we're not getting a response rate for curing the problems, even if they do come out. That's what an office of the tenant advocate would be following, someone who is laser focused on Department of Building code violations, but from a tenant's perspective. Again, council member, we've had this discussion a number of times, and I think we just disagree. The functions that are captured within the legislation, the functions that you've just described now, are functions that are currently being adequately carried out by the Department of Buildings. Tenant protection related issues, the use of construction to harass tenants is taken very seriously by this department. Those complaints are prioritized. As I explained earlier, they're forwarded to the building marshal's office for prioritized inspections. We're doing the work now. We have staff here who is reviewing the tenant protection plans. With the council's help, we now have a new law that sort of strengthens the plan, right? Requires more means and methods to protect tenants. Requires specificity. We're now performing more audits of those plans. We're now performing proactive inspections of tenant protection properties and mo occupied multiple dwellings. With your help, with the council's help, we're doing a lot of additional work to improve our ability to address this issue. Yeah. But again, the functions outlined in the Office of the Tenant Advocate are functions that are currently being addressed by the department. So just to be clear, um, I voted for Speaker Johnson. And if Speaker Johnson is going to tell me that you know, the council is taking a certain path, I'll raise my concerns in Democratic conference. But at the end of the day, I'm following my speaker's lead. This mayor signed this bill into law. 
and it came with two people, and it was intended to be a separate office. Thank you. So Thank you. This, this committee obviously supports its members and supports the, the bill and the law, so we will definitely be following up on behalf of uh, member Rosenthal and, and the city. And the tenants. Yeah. Thank you very much, Chair Carnegie. Thank you. Councilman Rivera. This is, it goes along with the councilwoman's comments. You know, because of all the construction as, as harassment that has been happening in New York City, it took a number of council people to come together and pass the stand for tenant safety, and I know that Council Member Chin brought this up earlier. So this is a comprehensive package trying to tackle this problem, and I wanted to follow up on my predecessor's bill, which was Local Law 159, the construction, Safe Construction Bill of Rights in lobbies and hallways and buildings under construction. And I want to know how is DOB going to assure compliance? I saw you had 1,200 inspections. That's great. Um, but I want to know specifically how you're going to be able to post this because a lot of people don't even know what their rights are, let alone to call a council person who's going to be able to make that phone call and help them out. So I want to know what you're going to do to assure that this is up and that you're, again, complying with the law that was passed. We are complying, and we have a separate tenant protection plan for all buildings uh, that are residential in nature, and we are We've laid out guidelines for the industry to as what they need to require and those plans. They're separate plans. They're made available for our inspectors. And when we go out there, uh, they're checking the, the tenant protection plans that they were required to be approved by the examiners. If they're not, they're getting summonses accordingly and stop work orders accordingly. Um, uh, and we are now doing the proactive inspections. So we have a methodology where we will identify buildings and visit them proactively without without responding to a complaint uh, as per the law. So we do think that we're compliant. And also, as part of that, as it relates to the Safe Construction Bill of Rights from Local Law 159, so that, that law is in effect. As of the end of last year, um, the department is enforcing it. There's a requirement that in these buildings, um, multiple dwellings, the owner needs to post this uh, Safe Construction Bill of Rights in the lobbies, by the elevator banks, throughout the entire building, HPD and the Department of Buildings is charged with enforcing that law, and we are enforcing that law. Are there any violations? Do you have any numbers pertaining to violations as to people I who are not posting I don't have that information that? available. I can, I can look into that and get back to you. I can look into see what complaints we've received, if any, and what's been our response to those complaints. So we can provide that information to the committee. Just to confirm that you're tracking it is my Understood. point. Okay. I look forward to those numbers. Thank you. So I guess this is the appropriate time to bring up uh, real-time enforcement. Uh, what's, what is budgeted for the creation of real-time enforcement, Local Law 188 of 2017, in the current fiscal year and in the out years? And how will this money be used to implement the creation and maintenance of an effective real-time enforcement unit? So obviously I'm referencing Local Law 188. So the real-time enforcement um, initiative is funded 19 positions um, in addition, and an additional $300,000 in this fiscal year. And the, um, the authorized positions for next fiscal year will grow to 57 with almost $4 million of PS costs associated with it. So I'm working with my colleagues on, um, on the enforcement efforts with uh, real-time enforcement. It's going to most likely result in a second shift where inspectors will be assigned to a second shift in order to respond to the complaints in the, in the necessary time frame as well as weekend coverage. And then additional inspectors will be assigned to um, the borough enforcement efforts to make sure that we're complying with those requirements. So do we have a, a time frame on like total implementation? So we were just funding these positions, but uh, currently we're addressing the issues with existing staff now. and. We're in the process of advertising and hiring up, so um, by the time the program gets fully implemented in, in fiscal year 19, we hope to be completely 100% up and running. And so I'll also add, as it relates to specific to this local law, the funding that's in the preliminary budget to, is to address tenant protection issues broadly in the full package of legislation. But as of today, we are in compliance with Local Law 188, both the response times for complaints and also the proactive inspections that the law requires as well. And then uh, local, one, local Law 149 of 2017 would prohibit professional, 
professionally certified filings for buildings where owners have been found guilty of tenant harassment. Does DOB have the, resource, the resources ordered as necessary to effectively implement local law 149, and what if any additional resources may be required? So that's obviously a capacity question. So we were provided an additional two um, positions to help strengthen the resources that currently do this work. Um, we're going to, as we continue to, to um, address the issues, we'll be assessing it, and if we need additional resources, we'll go back through the budget process and request them if necessary. Thank you. So my, my colleagues and I um, uh, have very few tools to help protect uh, tenants in the city, and those that we do have, uh, we have a reasonable expectation that they'll be supported uh, by DOB um, in our efforts to do what's right for tenants in, a, in an increasingly changing environment uh, that's not friendly uh, for long-term existing tenants. So uh, this is not necessarily a hostile environment, but people are very passionate about serving their communities and their constituents and providing safe environments for um, for their constituents across the city. And as you can see, uh, here represented, there, there or, or today there were several boroughs. So this is not, uh, these are not issues that are, are you know, uh, significant in only one borough. These are the 51 council members in 51 districts face varied degrees of, of these issues. And consequently, this committee is committed to hopefully working uh, in conjunction, continue uh, to work in conjunction to get some of this resolved. So if there are no more questions, I thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much. We look forward to continued work. Thank you. Absolutely. So at this time, if uh, uh, those people who have signed up who were, were uh, from the public, uh, and I'm so sorry, uh, Ligia, Lahia? Yes. Yes. I'm so sorry. Uh, oh, no, it's Nikki Ledger. Uh, Mr. Kamatsu. Ignacio. And that's it. The week is gone. So we're going to ask you all to come up to the podium. Um, there will be a portion affirming your testimony. And then we'll get right into. Um, as you as you well know that there are several hearings taking place at the same time, so I'm going to ask um, that you uh, we put we put a clock on. Sergeant at Arms, can I get some time on the clock? So if I can ask you to raise your right hand so that I can affirm your testimony. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. I do. So if, you, if you'll indul indulge me, I, I'm going to say ladies first. I hope no one okay. is opposed to that. No tenant protection plan was posted in my lobby. In fact, no DOB permit for work in that particular apartment, two floors below mine, was, was, was posted. And I had to go to the assemblywoman's office with an aide, go to the fire department, talk to the fire captain, and two days later, um, a DOB permit was posted, but no tenant protection plan has since been posted. And the 311 operator knows nothing about what a tenant protection plan is. Okay. My name is Nikki Ledger. I am a New York City tenant who supported then applauded the passage of 13 STS bills into law. The recent unfortunate events of 85 Bowery and 272 Stag Street are violations of Local Law 188, Real-Time Enforcement, and Local Law 150. The latter mandates that an order to repair has to be issued with every vacate order so that tenants may return as soon as feasible. What will be the penalty for violating these laws? How will they be enforced? It is already abundantly clear that assuming voluntary compliance will suffice is seriously flawed. The blatant disregard we witnessed suggests two things to me. 
one, abundant funding of real-time enforcement is required, and two, landlords in violation of either local law be arrested by New York's finest. They are in violation of New York City law, these landlords. Instead, we find ourselves signing petitions to the mayor for a written promise for a date by which tenants can go home as though local law 150 did not exist. The elderly tenants of 85 Bowery are no longer hunger striking but housed in hotels, not knowing how long it will be until they return to their homes. This is shameful. The situation was preventable, the laws were in place, but where was the enforcement of said laws? Hearing that 20 inspectors be funded for real-time enforcement unit, I was stunned. Not 120, not 220. Our STS laws are a magnificent creation. However, generous funding combined with a fully staffed DOB is mandatory for their function as laws. To make it happen and for real-time enforcement to work as it was designed to, to keep our New Yorkers safe, we all need to keep watching how matters unfold. Uh, uh, thank you for that testimony. I, I will say on behalf of your particular instance, we have, um, <laughs> you have one of the loudest advocates as it relates to, to, to the, the, that Bowery property and, and the council member who has brought to my attention these things. You heard our, our conversation about real-time enforcement. I just did, yes. Right, so I, I just want you to know that you have a commitment, my commitment, the commitment of your council member and the commitment of this committee to see this through and to have these laws implemented in a way that makes sense for residents. So Thank you. It, it's not where you want it to be, but right. I promise you that today was the beginning of us having, you know, uh, reviewing the oversight over over this. So, so I, I really apologize. And you can rely on people like myself to work with with people like yourself. I'm clear on that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Uh, I'll keep my uh, spoken comments uh, abbreviated, and I'll rely on my written testimony uh, in the interest of time. Um, my name is Ignacio Cabregui Lorda, and I'm the director of Legal Hand, a project of the Center for Court Innovation. I am here to urge the council to support the Center for Court Innovation as it seeks to strengthen and expand alternatives to incarceration and access the justice, justice program through a million dollars in support from the city council in fiscal year 2019. This includes a $500,000 continuation of funding for ongoing operations and a $500,000 enhancement, which will help us advance the City Council's goals of improving fairness, working toward the closure of Rikers Island, and bolstering access to justice. Included in the written testimony submission is a summary of this request, as well as a matrix that reflects the positive outcomes should the Council grant this request. Expanded support from the Council would also enable uh, the continuation of our public safety and alternative to incarceration programs throughout the five boroughs. Our programs, which include the Red Hook Community Justice Center, Crown Heights Community Mediation Center, the Midtown Community Court, Bronx Community Solutions, Queens Youth Justice Center, and Staten Island Center Justice Center have been documented by independent evaluators to improve safety, reduce uh, incarceration, and enhance public trust in government. With work we work with tens of thousands of New Yorkers each year at these project sites, and the vast majority of the people we serve at LGBTQ are LGBTQ youth, immigrants, low income, or people of color. Uh, the City Council's support has been invaluable to the success of the Center for Court Innovation. The Center looks forward to continuing the work with the Council to reduce incarceration and to enhance access to justice. We respectfully urge you to continue uh, to support our work, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak. I would be happy to uh, answer any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Um, I'm a supporter of the, the Crown Heights Mediation Center is in my district and have had the pleasure of working with them and seeing the results that they bring. So other than I support you and you can count on me. Uh, we appreciate all your support. Thank you. Thank you. I would just ask, there are two more people who signed up, if you could just join us at the podium, uh, both Brandon and Rolando. And I understand that you're STS advocates and uh, have had a long relationship. Um, I just asked Mr. Komatsu. Welcome back. Hi. Um, so, let's see. Um, <laughs> um, I was hoping to have the meeting in the main chamber where there was a TV screen where I could project the testimony on. Um, I had a conversation with Stephen Banks on December 14th of last year. I recorded him on audio. So let me use what he had to say to me during that public town hall meeting. I, I, I don't think that we. Transparency. 
I don't think that we have the capacity nor this, this is not that it's not that type of hearing. You can just give me your testimony, and I'll, I'll offline I'll listen to what Mr. Banks said. Bottom line is, um, HPD's commissioner testified today. She essentially misled you. I've spoken to that staff. I live in a building that isn't registered with HPD validly. It hasn't been registered with HPD since the beginning of September. Um, I'm looking at HPD's own website right now that confirms, it says this property is not currently validly registered with HPD. HRA gave that landlord, uh, let's see, um, more than $2 million to acquire that building to serve as a landlord. They're not making repairs. HPD issued a violation against that landlord in December of 2016. The building's been fixed. There's a hole in the roof in the building. It was leaking about a week, two weeks ago when it was raining pretty hard. I was assaulted in that building by my former uh, mentally unstable roommate. I got a concussion. He, that was after he had tried to, to assault me. Um, I, I was diagnosed with a concussion on July 30th of uh, 2016. And uh, basically the landlord pulled a bait and switch because everybody in the building, we signed one lease agreement. Then they gave us something entirely different. So we reported that fraud and forgery. No one took a corrective action. I talked to the Bronx DA on uh, March 17th of 2016, um, about two weeks after I moved into the building. They didn't do a darn thing. If they had, I wouldn't have been assaulted. Um, also, the landlord of the building is Urban Pathways. They're gonna have a fundraiser on, I think, May 10th at the Grand Hyatt. So the question is, if the CEO of that company is making 200,000 bucks a year, they're getting taxpayer money, um, they're not making repairs, what can you guys do about it? So um, you said Urban Pathways, I, I believe, is a, is a supportive housing it's, uh, program, correct? Um, no, they're actually more, like, for lack of a better description, embezzling the cash. So what I'd like to do is, and I've asked you to do this before, I don't know what's happened with us offline. I've reached uh, out. Um, so actually, I have my housing person here with me. Uh, I'd just like for you to talk to him offline because what your case is is an individual case, and, I, and I've always... There are more people in the building having similar issues. So I'd like for you to detail that for me, what's happening, so that we could be helpful. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Brandon. And, and I, I don't mean to be as informal as to call you by your first name, but I'd rather not butcher your last name. <laughs> thank you. So. Uh, Kilbasa is how it's pronounced, but thanks. Um, uh, oh, literally Kilbasa? Literally Kilbasa. I could have gotten that. Just Sorry. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, thanks, though. So my name is Brandon Kilbasa, and I'm the director of organizing at the Cooper Square Committee. Um, the Cooper Square Committee is a tenants' rights organization in the Lower East Side. Um, we specialize in tenant organizing. Uh, we're also a proud member of the Stanford Tenant Safety Coalition. And STS is a coalition of about 30 different housing groups from around the city that formed about three years ago to combat construction as harassment. Um, and if you don't know what that is, it's a huge, um, intense problem sweeping the city. It's a form of tenant harassment that basically landlords use the guise of construction to um, force rent regulated tenants out of their buildings. Um, so I'm here today in the capacity of, um, as a member of the STS coalition, we're asking for the funding that's in place uh, within the preliminary budget to stay intact um, for the new STS laws, um, of, uh, 13, uh, sw uh, 13 suite law of laws, 13 new laws that in basically created, uh, was created last year as the Stanford Tenant Safety Act. So we're ac asking for comprehensive funding of that uh, there are three laws in particular that we think have special considerations within the budget. Most of the laws are, are kind of budget or, or cash neutral, but um, Local Law 188, which is the real-time enforcement um, law that went into effect this month, is going to require about 30 new inspectors um, to create a new team um, to be out and doing targeted enforcement within communities facing construction as harassment. Uh, local Law 149, which is Council Member Chin's new law, which is going to require additional auditing of plans and permits, um, and Local Law 161, which is the new law that will create an office of the tenant advocate. So we're here today, here today to ask for you know funding for those laws. Uh, we all know that these new laws really only uh, have impact and become real when they're funded and the agencies can carry them out. So we're asking for that to happen today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, and thank you for all your work. Thank you. Good to work. 
Uh, hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Rolando Guzman, and I'm the uh, Deputy Director for Community Preservation at Sengnex Alliance, a uh, local community organization in North Brooklyn. We are also a proud member of SDS, and I'm going to um, uh, save a lot of time just by uh, give, uh, based on the background that uh, my colleague just gave. Um, I just want to talk briefly about, um, uh, first of all, I want to thank the city council. You know, I think uh, this process that we had, that was for over two years, uh, it was a true and great partnership between community organizations, tenants, and city council members. And, uh, and we are very happy that this uh, legislation passed through and, uh, and then that the actual mayor uh, join in in this effort. So I think it's a great example of legislation that is gonna protect tenants. However, though, we need to make sure that the Department of Buildings is enforcing this legislation and they also, that they need the, um, the resources uh, to, to, to fulfill their mandate. Uh, some tenants uh, or some people testify before referring to a building 272 stack, and I just wanna use that building as a reference how uh, the real-time enforcement will save tenants' homes. Uh, 272 Stack is a building in the East Williamsburg section, and back in November, a new owner purchased that property and started doing work with our permits right away. Uh, it took the Department of Buildings about two months to go to <coughs> inspect that property. They were very close to be vacated because the landlord did such aggressive construction in the building, demolition. Uh, the funding for DOV, we wanna make sure that the staff a new unit that is going to respond to that kind of emergencies within 12 hours. Uh, we really uh, look forward, you know, the creation of the real-time enforcement unit, um, that a specific unit that tenants can call and inspectors will re respond within 12 hours. I think that alone is going to prevent a lot of tenants being vacated from their buildings. And again, we want to thank the leadership uh, of you in this committee, and we look forward to working with you. So, so the reality is none of the work we could do, we do here could be completed if we didn't have advocates on the ground really working directly with tenants. So again, I appreciate uh, the work that you do and I would be uh, surprised if the funding wasn't available to continue your work. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I also wanted to really thank the advocate. It was, it was amazing that we all can come together two years and 13 legislations passed. And I was also very happy to see the mayor put in uh, money in the preliminary budget. So we have to make sure that money stays there and get actually, uh, and get DOB to utilize it and stop the implementing the laws. But thank you for all your great work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This hearing is now adjourned.